that wasn't, uh, that could end up not being very profitable. So it became harder and harder to do true journalism against big corporations. And I kind of look at the passion of true journalism because I'm on my own and nobody came in and said, hey, you're making Honeywell look bad. You're making Dow this film. And one of the things um, that I think is important, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about taking on some sort of challenge, this film is basically stories about people, individuals in the community that decided a lot better for a lot of people. And so that's what I tried to do to try to make an impact. And of course, you know, when, when I started this film, I was doing a lot of sports. So this sport. And people who I was about. And I did. We have one planet. We have more planets, but we only have one planet we can live on. And, uh, and the mess and really so uh, how I got started with this this project. This gentleman, his name is Bill Hoppy. I met three workers at a plant in Venice, Illinois, which is right across the river from St. Louis, right across the Mississippi River, and uh, they all had cancer working at the same plant. They were all roughly the same age. And um, they were complaining about not being in this complicated government program called the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. I, that's really the name of, the, the, of this program, which is you know uh, a ridiculous name, but that's the name of the program. That program was designed to compensate nuclear workers who uh, worked with these materials, radioactive materials, and these toxins during the Manhattan Project in the Cold War. And Don Thompson is the guy on the left. These gentlemen felt like one of their co-workers had been compensated in this program, and they're like, well, why not me? I should be in the really journey. I wasn't trying to make I was I saw radioactive material on some plant like that. Malincroft is a pharmaceutical company in St. Louis. The that lady is Diane Ratliff. You know when people say, "Not my best," but your it's the That plant spewed out a lot of toxins out of those smokes and up uh, a lot of people in that neighborhood had gardens, and they were concerned about along with the question of these workers, led to me actually. The guy on the left is Don Thompson, this one of the workers I was talking about, that Venice plant. And, uh, and he, he, I had to file for it for compensation for her mom and realize what a disaster the program really was because she just jumped through all these hoops and I'll explain that a little bit later. But that one woman who <laughs> people really don't know who that woman is. I mean, 
if people compare her to Erin Brockovich, and Erin Brockovich took on basically one uh, private company, and she did a great job with that. That woman there took on the United States government and won. So, um, and I'll get her. The woman in the pink is um, Winnie Verhoff, who is a historian and a person that uh, uh, I interview in the film. And she basically you know, was really serious about her history and making sure things were accurate. And I really had to convince her to be in the film because when I introduced myself as a cameraman for like Coronel Baseball, she was like, do I want to be in a film with some guy that does Cardinal baseball, talking about these issues? Maybe not. So I had to convince her. And I, and, uh, the gentleman next to her is Brian Zink, who is a lawyer who committed himself to fighting for these workers to get them through that program. You know, that's his main practice, is helping workers get through the program. And, you know, that is uh, Diane Ratliff and her brother, uh, Calvin. Enrico Fermi. Okay, a lot of you guys know who he is. Um, once the United States decided during uh, World War II that we needed to make a bomb before the Germans would make a bomb, we had to kind of figure out how to do it was the splitting of the atom and controlling it. So a self-sustained chain reaction. We had to be able to make the chain reaction and be able to control it. And that's what Enrico Fermi was going to do in Chicago. In order to do that project, somebody had to refine tons of uranium. Nobody had really done that before on the level, on the scale that he needed it done. So they go around to a couple of um, bigger uh, chemical companies and people were like, mm, I don't think so. Sounds kind of dangerous. Don't really want to do it. We'll pass. Malincrot. That's where we came in. Malincrot Chemical Company was this pharmaceutical company in St. Louis. They agreed to take on that job, okay? And if they did not refine, we might not have a bomb. Or if we did have a bomb, it would take a lot longer. St. Louis, most of you probably never heard of this company. <laughs> and probably never heard of that because you've heard of Los Alamos. You've heard of Hanford that uh, made the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb. And you've heard of uh, Oak Ridge. But St. Louis and Malincrot, probably not so much. These were some of the first nuclear workers in history, and some of the most contaminated workers in history in that plant got extremely contaminated. These workers, they, they basically were studying these workers, studying them as they were getting sick, making reports, not telling the workers very much information about that, unfortunately. That's Chicago Pile One. Um, this is an this is the, uh, the first sustained chain reaction. So basically, Malincrot refines that uranium in St. Louis, ships it up to Chicago for Fermi to do this chain reaction. Kind of where um, I think the lackadaisical attitude begins, and as far as handling these dangerous materials. They did this on the campus of the University of Chicago. They initially were going to do it way out in the woods because they knew how dangerous this was. This is, a, uh, this is a reactor, an unshielded reactor that could just like melt out. And so they were going to go way out into the woods, which is now the property of Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, there was a work stoppage. Now, what does that mean? That's they just listed as a work stoppage. So probably the workers wanted a little bit more money. It's, it's in the 1940s. They probably wanted like, what is it, like a nickel or a dime, an hour more or whatever. Just pay them. <laughs> you know, it's, you're in the United States government. You're going to settle this. But they were like, no, it, we're not going to pay those guys. That's unheard of. Let's just go down to Chicago <laughs> downtown and just do this chain reaction. So that's uh, just fascinating. And that kind of reckless kind of attitude from there, it just kept on going. Marie Curie, okay. She was a, a lot of you guys know her. Uh, uh, she discovered radium, coined the phrase radioactivity. Uh, first woman to win the Nobel Prize. First person, man or woman, to win it twice. People talk about, you know, when I started, when I, when I tell people about this film and about nuclear workers, they're like, what's your film about? I said, it's about nuclear waste and about nuclear workers getting sick. And the first thing to me right off the bat is, well, they didn't know. And I don't know why sometimes they say that, because um, 
they haven't, you know, they haven't really even looked into a lot of research of it. But I think that natural reaction of, hey, they didn't know. That's why they didn't know. I think we want to believe that. Because we don't want to believe that somebody knew and just let people get sick. That's an unsettling feeling. This woman died, I think, in 1934. And Mellencroft doesn't get the contract until 42. People knew in the scientific community all about her. And they knew how she died dealing with these radioactive um, materials. Like some of her work now is to, it's in a, like a lead box to be used. That's how contaminated she was. Now, workers on the line probably didn't know about her, didn't know about how she died, but people supervising those workers probably did. So these are some of the Mallinckrodt workers who became some of the most contaminated workers in history. The Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program has paid out $120 million to workers from this plant. This compensation program has paid out $1 billion across the country. So that's a lot of sick workers. And these are just people who have heard of this program. Most people have never heard of this program. How can you apply to get in it if And there's certainly are running around doing commercial ads saying, hey, did you work doing the Manhattan Project and get sick? Well, you can get in this program. It hasn't been working that way. Part of one of the reasons why I did the film, get the film out there, let workers know, hey, there's a program for you, and also put pressure on Congress or anybody else who might this. This is a program that could get cut. Because if you don't know about it, you, you don't know what you lost. So that's one of the, that's one of the main things that kind of drove me to, to, to this film out there. After we drop the bombs in Japan, the war ends, but then the Cold War breaks out. That plant downtown refine the original uranium for self-sustaining chain reaction, completely can't radioactive dust all up in the ceilings. And with all these plants, but this project, I really know too much about I just assume everybody working in a plant like this was walking around in a hazmat. Good morning. You know, that's my feeling. But a lot of people were just, those, those workers, as we're just handling the material with their bare hands. They did that for five years. Then, see, new man, the people dying of cancer, they started putting two and two together. Um, am I going to? They contaminate that plant, they decide the Cold War breaks out, we need more bombs. This new plant out in Weldon Spring. They nicknamed this plant the clean one because you know, that first plant that they had, you know, was never designed to do that kind of work. Quickly assemble this work and they contaminate the building. The plan with this plant was to not do that, obviously. But this plant gets completely contaminated. Now they learned a lot more, but didn't protect those workers enough. They end up getting sick also. Because there's two plants doing the same thing. Fernald, which you, some of you guys probably heard of, 
It's a feed materials plant, just like this plant. So the government decided we don't need two plants doing the same thing. We're going to close. Malakrat just walks away and leaves all this material just sitting out there. You can see it start, for over a decade, it starts to degrade. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, there's no, you, there's no even more. I mean, that's another uh, barrel. This is the cleanup crew when they have to come in and clean this up. Now, that's another situation. Uh, a lot of those guys got sick doing that not really being told a lot of information about what's in this plant. You just need to get in there and clean that plant up. Those are better. When Weldon builds that new plant, the unique own that terror. I got rid of stuff. Uh, Garvey. Okay. And that well fill provided drinking. Oh, it's about, I think you need to clean up the. The University of Chicago, irresponsible. Gee, you need to get out here and clean this up. We live out here. We get our drink and. I think that's our that got contaminated, knocked that building down. All these plants get contaminated, and then they just not. Cell. Now, you guys might be looking at that and seeing those stairs. And you might be saying, well, why would anybody want to do that? That seems ridiculous. <laughs> Get up there. So we have like all of these school kids that, uh, that I should in perpetuity, so forever. That's kind of what I was talking about. That cell is going to be out there for
that dollars a year to just keep track of that cell and keep track of the materials now. Really, so one of the reasons why I wanted to tell this particular story and uh, the plant starts starts blowing stuff out of their stacks just like that other plant over die. The opening scene, these kids like swimming around in this contaminated water, and a, a guard comes up and says, Get out of that water thing here. So, um, huge. starts refining their uranium they didn't consider that waste they ordered Malacrat to bring that material out there to the airport and just store it out there so winds blowing this goes down through people's neighborhoods but nobody's thinking about that back then just store it out there so we can make money and sell it as they're bringing the material out there bringing it out there and just regular old dumb just blown out out to St. St. Louis uh, County where the airport is you can see how they just spilt it going on out there. These are uh, photos from the Department of Energy for the cleanup. So somebody does buy it. A company called Cotter Corporation out of Colorado. Mining corporation and they want that uranium. But what they don't want to do is spend too much money shipping that material all the way to Colorado. So they decide, we're just going to strip this material right there in St. Louis. They purchase the material and move it over here to this lot on Laddie Avenue. And they hire guys. This is going to be your job to strip this uranium out. Most of those guys, of course, don't know anything about what they're doing. They end up getting sick doing that job. Westlake Landfill, some of you guys might have seen this on the news. Westlake, so Cotta Corporation, they get what they want out of that material. They get their uranium out, they ship that to Colorado. What's left over is this barium sulfate cake that's radioactive. They decide to hire a subcontractor called B&K, and they just dump it in that landfill. Well, nobody's paying attention. Years later, a woman uh, named Margaret Freivogel, Fry who's in my film, she starts kind of tracking this material. Not the government, not the uh, EPA, not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Just a reporter, just doing her job, just saying, what's going on here? What happened to that material? Did it get to Colorado? She finds out, well, you know, some of it did. Some of it ended up there in that landfill. So here's the problem with that, it's an obvious problem. That's an unlined, unlined landfill. This happens in the, in the city. It's been in there all these decades. It's all mixed up, mixed in with trash. People want it out of there. People who live around that, that landfill want that material out of there. There's a submerged fire in there. 
underground fires happen all the time in landfills. People are concerned that that fire is gonna reach that waste and then what, it's gonna go airborne and get into our neighborhood. People are very upset about this. So that's where that sets. The uh, corporation and the landfill owners, they don't really wanna pay to move that material out of there, even though it's their fault. You, the taxpayer, might end up paying for that. The biggest estimate I saw to move the most of it, or almost all of it out of there, is something like $600 million. They don't want to pay that. So they're probably going to battle in court to keep it there. And that was initially the, the, the um, energy's first idea. They're like, well, this is a landfill. What are you guys worrying about? You can't build your house in there. That's a landfill. You're not going to live in there. You can't get to it. The material can't get to you. We'll just leave it there. Those people just said, nope, that's not good enough. And then they just protested and protested and put a lot of pressure on politicians. And now they come up with a plan. Okay, we're going to compromise and we'll move some of it out of there. And we'll see where that goes. Uh, that's the dial plant. That's a top-down view of the first plan I was talking about where the workers that I, um, I met worked. Now, as you can see, up in that upper left corner, that's just like a big lot. That's pretty. And they basically would just take their material, barrels and whatnot, and just bury it in that lot out there. They put something like 100,000 tons of thorium into that lot, just dumped it in there because they figured this is our private property. We own this. We feel like dumping that stuff out there. And it's none of your business what we're doing here. People like Diane Ratliff and Calvin, who live around that neighborhood, thought it was their business and didn't like it. Wanted it cleaned up. So a lot of, a lot of the work that gets that gets done on sites like this, because we, we talk about, and there's a lot of talk about private, government not doing their job, private not doing their job, who's, who's at fault here? The reality is really both are at fault, okay? Government has certain responsibility. Private companies do too, you know? Um, if you're a private company and you hire a private contractor to clean up your private property they figured this is none of your business. I don't have to post this information up there like the Department of Energy or the EPA does. When this site, all those reports, those pictures that I saw up there, it's, you, anybody can access that stuff. Public record. Private stuff, most of the stuff that they did at that plant, I don't have to tell you anything. This is my plant, this is my private property and I hired a private contractor to come in here and clean it up. Most of the stuff, or half the stuff, I learned about what happened at that plant, I learned about from the workers that worked there. I went out there and I thought, we poured stuff right down the drain. What do these, what do these sites look like now? Before I get to that, let me back up workers that work there. What happened to them who were trying to get into the program? What's the answer to their question? Why am I not in this program? I spent five years making this film trying to answer that question and other questions. Well, why didn't they get in? Because the program is set up for weapons work for the government. Not nuclear power, not nuclear medicine, Weapons work for the government. And if you're doing work for a contractor, for the government at that point, you're working for a private contract. Let's say you're working for GE or your radioactive material is going to GE's plant. Well, the government figures GE should pay you. You got sick working for them. This program's for our workers. The problem with that is, is obviously GE or Shaw Corporation on these big companies, they're not going to pay you. Or you have to go into some battle against lawyers, you're probably going to lose. 
if you got the money to take them on. So the work that's being done inside these plants is distinguishable between weapons work and nuclear power. Same material, same building you're working in. So you get sick, guys, they will say, I'm sorry. You don't fit into that time slot of working for the government denied. A lot of reasons to get denied. Secretary, they have these categories. You might have been a secretary, but you're walking through the same plant that these other people are walking through. Denied. Contractor, you weren't a full-time person. Denied. Stuff like that. You drove for forklift. Uh, who worked at Fernald, he said he was a forklift driver. He was driving the material in and he'd have to decontaminate his forklift all the time, sometimes swap out his forklift. Uh, you're just a forklift driver. He's like, I'm driving the material around. Why would I be denied? Why, why is there all this, all this forklift? I'm the guy driving it. So there's a program. Obviously, it's awesome program, you know, they need to pay a lot more attention to, to work, how they're, how they're getting sick, and expand it. That's what I'd like to see. So, what happened to Diane Ratliff, who's looking at that plant? Nothing. That's a low income area. There's a lot of sites in St. Louis. What well, kind of upper class? People started making noise. You didn't want to make too much noise because prices would kind of start to go down. So that was the problem they were kind of dealing with. How much do we really want to talk about Weldon Spring? This house out here shut it down a little bit. This situation. They can't even get the EPA material. At least they were testing in Walden, Westlake, with a lot of noise. Noise for a long time. Eddie Avenue. Remember the picture mound of material that Cotter was stripping? But that's technically cleaned up, but as you can see, it's a I don't know that anybody's ever going to put anything in the building there. You probably. There's other. It's in that is. So there's all the work. Active stuff. Built a, a rail spur. In bring trains in to dump the material. Train cars. A burrito wraps Harp down into the train car, dump the material in, fold that big tarp, and then they put a cap of that, drive it. And wave it. No gear. Job, you probably end up staying there. You're out there. Shoot the interview, and then there's footage of people of all over there. So They wanted to make use of that land. It's right like the uh, there 
there and check it. So they start checking there. Still. You can see. That's kind of that, that. I mean, so I. All these years later, material out of there. Shouldn't it have been done? Twenty thirty. Probably forever. And digging and finding more. And Got a big plan. Song and dance for people who live around. Do that. Get it. And the, the bomb, material, time, cancer, down of this. Most of them think. But as you can see, they're off. That's their cell. You cover it. I went out uh, look like that. They have a museum out there. But, uh, stick to the trail. Out there, you know, the, the contaminated groundwater. Uh, Mallinckrodt, where it all started. That's the front. Just pour it, you know, Mississippi River's right on the other side of that. Pour it into the Mississippi. That site there, Cannon, Cannonburg Disposal Site. Uh, National Defense Programs by the Weapons. 
Look at it. And unlike us with all the rocks and everything, it's put some grass over that. That just, it, would you know what that was? If you just drove past that? Uh, this, the first one in there, they, they got this one. And as you can see, there was a fence. They don't want you in there. Okay. So they... And, and make it in there and didn't actually get in there. It's kind of hard to say. Um, he's rocked in the blue was so significant. When they put the program together, they, it, you know, it's political. The senators. special for their site was they picked four sites and they said, you know, my site in my state is super contaminated. Buildings don't even exist anymore. And I don't know how much exposure you got. I'm going to guess at it, you know. So that's what dose reconstruction is. these 22 cancers, you're in. Now, when the program started, there were only four sites that had that status. What Denise Brock, that woman in the blue, was trying to do was make our site, Malincrot, nobody had ever done that before, and they did not want her doing that. Because if she was going to be successful, other people were going to say, my site's messed up too. I need SEC, I, which is what happened. Denise Brock wins that case because she basically has these documents about, uh, she filed a FOIA along with uh, Kay Dry and Denise DeGarmo to get these documents about what was going on at these sites. And once they got that information, it was hard to beat her because they were basically talking back and forth about these workers being contaminated. So um, as more sites have come on to get the SEC, now I think there's something like 90 sites. When she started, it was four. So she put all these people through. When I first met her, that program had paid out $8 billion. Now it's up to $17 billion. That's a lot of money. So she made a big, she made a huge impact. Workers across the country. Anybody else? So did I answer that question? <laughs> I mean, because I mean, there are a lot of workers who get denied who say, hey, look, okay, like Don Thompson, okay. Don Thompson? had cancer, uh, skin cancer, okay? okay? As you can see, Don Thompson's an older guy. His doctor was an old guy, too, who died years ago. Don Thompson can't prove that he had skin cancer. doctor died. He's got no record of it. So they're like, sorry. People who say, I worked at that site, they say, prove it. You got your work badge, you got what, you know, and if you can't prove it, the site don't exist anymore. It's closed, been closed down for 60 years. It makes it very difficult. Um, oh, thank you. I, I've, I've been thinking a while about how I want to phrase this question. So we have, um, we had an oil refinery in the South. That was, well, the neighborhood around there had a three times, I think three times greater rate of cancer. Um, asthma than the rest of Philadelphia because of the oil refinery nearby. And that oil refinery recently blew up and we came like really close to releasing a bunch of dangerous chemicals into Philadelphia. Um, on top of that, there are sources of energy like coal that kill millions of people every year. And climate change is set up to kill tens of millions of people in the next few years. So 
On the subject of nuclear power, what, what, do you, what do you think should be done if the energy sources are killing so many people? That's an excellent question. I, I, I've gotten the question before, and, and the argument that proponents of nuclear power have is it's clean, right? That's the argument. Did that presentation look clean? So, yeah, what's coming out at the end, that steam that you're producing, yeah, that part's clean, but the mining and the milling and the material and where, where are you going to put that material? I hope you don't just decide to dump it in a landfill because you save money by doing that. That's what's going on. So many people, I mean, people will have, I'll take that contract to get rid of that waste and then literally drive it across the street and dump it. So that's a problem. So if we, if we decide to do nuclear power, even, you know, we decide to make more weapons. Uh, we got to decide what we're going to do with that material. And I don't think anybody's really answered that yet. Here's the other thing, too. People don't want your nuclear waste in their state. We have that all the time to Idaho. And they're trying to bring like our material out there. And I met with like uh, environmental groups, the Snake River Alliance, who are incredible people. They brought me out to Idaho. And they said, we like you, Tony. We like your film. We don't want your waste out here. I don't blame them. So I don't know if we have some sort of deal where if you make a mess, it stays in your state. You know, because that they put material on a train from Fernald and brought it to St. Louis, dumped it in that quarry. We, you know, we don't want Fernald's, we, we, we don't want our own waste there. So if you decide to make these types of materials in places that are licensed facilities now, they're starting to like, people who live in those states are like, you know what, why, why are we taking everybody's waste? Do it. So that's something that needs to be thought about. Any other Anyone? questions? Hi, Tony, am I allowed to ask too? Oh yeah. <laughs> Me. Uh, did you spend five years making this film? Yes. Um, is, did you have a team of people helping you do the research? Because you had access to what, government documents, site plans, all kinds of things. Or you know, were you kind of a one-man band? How did, how did you do it? <laughs> that is an excellent question. OK. Um, I started off working with two other guys. And they eventually just kind of dropped off because when you're not making any money doing something like this, you're just doing it because you care about it, you know. Now, I own my own television gear from sports. It's very popular. People just want to sit and watch sports all day long. And so I got my gear, and I shot all these interviews. I live in St. Louis, and I didn't have to drive very far. And then when I did go to Chicago and different places, I just drove. It's searching, getting my paperwork and stuff. I had to do a lot of that. One, a friend of mine um, came on to the project who had, um, unfortunately had, had fallen, I had injuries, how he was suffering concussion syndrome, basically. So his name is Chris, Chris Ballou. He was very helpful to me. But suffering from that, sometimes he would have to just rest you know I, I would go like I would know his symptoms were bothering him because he would just go away like I wouldn't have any emails I wouldn't have any phone calls from I just knew he was but then he would come back and he'd be ready okay I'm ready uh, photos and different things he helped me with the research something like this on the research because you want to get everything is accurate because it's a Dow Chemical, like your film. Oh, look at here. He said 1943. It was 1942. <laughs> you can't trust the film. It's all trash, you know. So, <laughs> you really, it's have to be on top of stuff like that. And then the biggest, why it took five years. What's going on with you, dude? Are you like a turtle? Um, I work with my regular jobs. We'll come into town. They play for like seven days. I work and then the Cardinals would go on the road on this film. 
I do the do the blues hockey game. They will leave. And and then you know one of the I always tell people I could have done if people would just return my email or phone calls. You know that's how people. Don't. I know it's not really their. Job. I need one photo of Uzo. He was at your university. Can you just send it to me? Who you know? Or it the of a film like this comes down the road. That's where all the money is. So they, they look at, I show them a trailer or something, they're like, I believe in what you're doing. I believe in, I'm gonna give you the photo. It's up to them. And somebody will say, I kinda like you, you're seeing like $600 for this photo. <laughs> and I get it, you know? And uh, so it's that, and it composed all the music. He's in Boston, across his website. And, the, the, and I said, this is what I want to use your music for. Yep. And he said, um, you know, probably have a lot of money. I'm going to let you have my music very modest. That's how I got it. That I had, you know, I applied for some great stuff. So really, I think when people do something like this or a project like the reasons is About with this stuff before, it's not brand new. Some of it, uh, but uh, uh, say, hey, it's on Amazon. Check this out, or it's on Vimeo. Or whatever. Keep looking. At I always say like a billion. Oh my. So at time the two concussions will in room is. starting at 
important uh, for dealing with various aspects of climate change, climate adaptations, and, and keeping our society going in a, in a well-worked way. The talks today um, highlight these aspects from water purification, waste reduction, biofuels, and food waste uh, usage. With that, I'd like to, since we're a little late, I'd like to start off um, with the session. And what we'll do is have each speaker or group of speakers come up, give their talk, sit back down again, and then at the end, everybody will come up, uh, the, the main speakers will come up for the uh, moderated discussion afterwards. Uh, try to keep our time to eight minutes. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce our first talk. Um, it's a, we have three speakers, um, Thais, pardon my pronunciation, Edie Infanti, Alex Wiley, and John Card can come on up and let's start your talk. There we go. All right. Good morning. Thank you for having us here today. I am John Card. I'm a pre-junior here in construction management. We have Thais, who's a senior in global studies, and Alexis, who is a pre-junior in environmental science. And we're going to be discussing biochar, which can be utilized as a water filtration system, and, which, and is very easy to, to implement, which has great applications for, and potential for water sovereignty. We took a trip, an intensive course abroad, to Plenitude in Las Marias, Puerto Rico, over December. We went there with nine other students, and Steve Dolph, the faculty member there, a faculty member here who traveled with us there. Uh, Plenitude is a nonprofit located in Las Marias and is founded in 2008. It is a permaculture demonstration farm and they have pro programs such as agricultural ecology, super adobe building structures, and rainwater harvesting systems. And they're working and uh, teaching uh, this into their community and teaching it to programs like ours that go and get to learn from their experiences. Their mission there is demonstrating service through love demonstrating love through service, excuse me. Um, and they really bring this forward every day with their intentional living. Um, and it really goes full circles, uh, full circle in working with the permaculture there. Before we went there, we did some community-based learning and as well as some reflections and it helped us to ground ourselves and better situate where we were coming from as Drexel students as we were going and working with the community and working with the staff there. And helped us to better engage and collaborate as we worked with ourselves, with the staff and with the community there. Each evening we, were, we would go and after working on their different programs and different projects, we would go and guided by Steve, we would do these self-reflections. And we would allow us to better grow as individuals, as a group, and also with the staff there. And this really came full circle uh, with the intentional living and really uh, grounded us in this sustainable and in, in these arts and in these growing as an individual. And it was a phenomenal experience for all of us. Uh, to talk more about the biochar, we have access. Hi, so one of the main projects that we worked on was the creation of biochar, which is part of Plenitude Sustainability and Resiliency Initiative. Um, so you're probably wondering, what is biochar? And it is basically a wood-based charcoal filter. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through the process of how we created that while we were there. So we harvested about 90 liters of coffee wood. Typically, if you have a dead plant, you're probably gonna throw it out. But instead of wasting that wood product and that natural product, um, we harvested it to fill this 90 liter barrel that you see in the right photo. Um, and it was burned in what's called a top lift updraft system. So in the previous slide, you can see Raymond lighting it from the top. And we attached this like funnel piece, which is the updraft part of the T-LUD system. Um, basically what that does is restrict oxygen flow through the um, T-LUD system. It has to enter through the bottom. At the base of it is 300 holes. And because it's restricting oxygen flow, that controls the temperature and rate at which it burns. And so that allows the wood to maintain its protein structure, specifically lignin, um, and that makes it very microporous. So the biochar material can adsorb instead of absorb the water. And absorb means that it's going to chemically bind with the water and filter out chemical particulates and as well as any physical particulates that are very small. The end product yields about 30 liters of biochar or a third of the container. And immediately after finishing the burn, we have to rest and seal it with a mud cement for four to six hours. So here is Raymond. Um, he's using a candle, basically swiping it along the side of the T-LED system. And wherever the fire stops is basically telling you where the fire is located. You'll know that it's done either when the fire stops at the base of it or you'll see the fire at, through the bottom of the holes. 
After that, we spent a few hours making a mud cement, just mixing some mud and some water, sealed it up, as you can see in the um, leftmost folder, oh, excuse me, leftmost fo photo. <clears throat> Um, let it rest for four to six hours, and here you can see our end product with the biochar. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the way that biochar is burned is meant to preserve its microporosity, uh, use it for freshwater sources only, not saltwater sources. So, you can use groundwater, you can also use it for rainwater. So, what Plenitude is planning on doing is using it with their rainwater harvesting system in order to give people more access to potable drinking water in their communities. And so this is what the filtration system would look like. In the first barrel, you have an assortment of rocks that are set up um, from top, bottom to top, largest to smallest. Uh, and the second barrel is a sand barrel with rocks at the bottom. And in the third barrel is the biochar with rocks at the bottom. Um, the rocks at the bottom of the last two barrels are meant to allow a pressure release, basically. Um, so there's more water accessible between those pores so it can flow easily into the next barrel. Uh, the first barrel is set up in size arrangement so it can filter out particulates by size physically. In the sand barrel, um, it's also meant to do physical separation, but a biofilm will form at the top of it um, with some bacteria that will filter out cholera, E. coli, and other waterborne um, bacterial diseases. And the biochar filter portion of the filter, again, is meant to do absorbing filter filtration. So it will filter out chemical particulates that are in the water, as well as any physicals, um, physical particulates that have a very small pore size. Biochar can last up to three years, the filtration system as well, um, but it does require regular cleaning and maintenance. The sand barrel needs to be cleaned every three months. Um, and then once you're done, you can use the biochar material as a compost once you tre treat it with a compost tea, and that way it just has the right chemical gradients to be absorbed in the soil. Um, and then the rocks and the sand you can use in other construction or gardening pro projects throughout. Um, Thais is going to talk to you about some of the uh, global impacts of using this biochar filter. Hi, everyone. So what does this mean for waste? So one standard biochar system can uh, yield about 300 liters a day, and that's equivalent to about 600 standard plastic water bottles. Also, so if you think about your water filtration systems at home, such as a Brita or a Berkey system, those um, filters, filtration systems are quite expensive to recycle and a very tedious process, so oftentimes they're just thrown away. For the health impact, clean water is a basis for good health, and after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, water systems were out for days, weeks, months at a time, so a lot of people had to source from, not, from the not the best water sources and weren't using or accessing clean water. And as the second barrel um, in the system checks for cholera, which is very important, because one to, there's 1.3 1 to, 1 to 4 million cases of cholera per year. Um, it's really important to keep everybody healthy in Puerto Rico and just also other um, climates like such. And finally, uh, the social impact. So Plenitude uh, on the farm, they have workshops teaching about rainwater harvesting systems and also biochar, teaching these um, lessons to community members and, and uh, inhabitants of the island. Now they can take that back to their community and bring back rainwater harvesting systems. It's been built for schools, also just local water and communities and for gardening. And when, through the spread of that knowledge, they can empower communities to now sort of separate themselves from the colonial systems that are already in place. And, and eventually that leads to, leads to liberation and they rely less on the access to um, community water that isn't always clean. And also um, it, take, it breaks them away from the system. And if you want to know any more information, um, please check out Plenty Two's website. Also, we want to thank the Lindy Center for their um, support of the community-based learning system and the College of Arts and Sciences. And Thank you.
Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Joel um, Jez Jejuson um, from Lebeau. Um, Joel, which one is your talk? What's that? Jedison? Jay Shadas. Thank you. Which is your talk? That's the problem. I don't. The names aren't on it. Is that you? Blockchain. All right. All right. And you are. Matthew. And Matthew. <laughs> Matthew will join him. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joel J. Sudasen. I'm Matthew Cerny. And today we will be investigating the uses of blockchain in incentivizing and reducing waste in Ghana. So first off, what is blockchain? Blockchain is essentially an innovative new way to store information. It boils down to a secure and immutable ledger of information that is distributed and public to all users on the blockchain network. So by public, all nodes or users can see the information on the blockchain ledger. Um, nodes are simply the entities that can, 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 that can add records onto the blockchain. Records are simply bits of information. It could be you know, the full text of the Harry Potter series, or it could be you know, the details of a financial transaction. And so records are grouped into blocks, um, and blocks are linked together chronologically to form a blockchain. Now, blocks are linked together by a hash code. This is what makes the blockchain immutable. If you are to simply go into the record containing the full text of Harry Potter and remove simply a period, the entire hash code connecting that block to another block would reconfigure and the change would be negated. So in order to make a change to the block, you'd have to concatenate another record onto the end, saying, okay, I want um, the record containing the Harry Potter series to um, have this period on this page removed. As a result, you can see the changes made to each subject and object represented on the blockchain across the timeline. This uh, introduces unparalleled transparency and trackability, which is um, the two main advantages of blockchain that we'll be focusing on today. Okay, so the need for blockchain. The current system in Ghana right now is, ex is extremely broken and honestly ineffective. So right now there's no incentivization for people of Ghana to actually recycle, and currently they have this carefree attitude of, okay, I have this recyclables and waste, I could just toss it in a landfill and call it a day. However, according to the Journal of Environmental and Public Health in 2019, they conducted a study and shown that 82% of Ghanaians are willing to pay for recycling services and management. 54% are actually even willing to pay more for better and efficient service. And of the 54%, 62% reasoning behind this is because is it an increase in frequency of uh, lifting. In other words, um, the, their recycling is a hassle and Ghanaians want a minimalistic um, approach to their recycling system. Okay, so a lot of pictures and errors. So you just have this breaks down. It's a use case for using blockchain to incentivize uh, recycling in Ghana. Um, essentially, a household would have its recyclables. They would input the recyclables into a government-issued uh, recycling container. Um, one of 25 of the recycling companies that are currently operating in Ghana would come in, dispatch a recycling truck. That recycling truck would, would come in, pick up the recyclables from the recycling bin. They would take it to their processing plant. They would um, you know, process the materials, turn that into a profit by selling it, out, selling it off. Um, and then they would be taxed on that. Currently, the Ghanaian government doesn't really have very stable sources of taxation income. This would be a good way to, um, to create one. Uh, and so here's where blockchain comes in. So when the recycling company comes in to pick up the recyclables, they would essentially, for simplicity's sake, scan a QR code. That QR code would concatenate a record onto the blockchain saying, okay, this amount of recyclables um, were collected from households, say, like household 9A. Um, the government would see that the household um, recycled and in this amount, and contingent upon that, they would factor that into the amount of government aid that they give this household. As a result, by creating a trade-off between the amount of government aid that a household um, takes in and the amount of recycling that they do, you're incentivizing recycling using blockchain. Another reason for blockchain is accountability. 44% of waste is collected across the six metropolitan areas, leaving 56% 50 of waste being unchecked which is illegally disposed by either burning or dumping. 
Additionally, 95 tons of e-waste per day reaches its final destination in Ghana. So who actually is responsible for this? Currently, we do not know, but with blockchain, we could have the ability to figure out who, who the people are and with, uh, allow for accountability to be uh, represented. Um, according to the Greenpeace International, they did an investigation and companies such as Philips and Sharp are potential culprits for dumping in Ghana. And currently they deny this, but again with blockchain we can figure out if these companies are actually doing this act. So here's another use case for blockchain in holding these e-waste polluters accountable. According to the 2017 e-waste report um, done in conjunction with the UN, 20% of e-waste is actually properly recycled, 4% has to OECD countries, while the last 76% is you know, in the dark. Nobody knows who's accountable for it. Using blockchain, we can figure out how much of this is going to Ghana and who's accountable for the, for the e-waste that's hanging into Ghana. Um, the Global North, that's essentially developing countries. It could be the US, CU, Australia, et cetera. Um, they would ship their e-waste into the, the Ghanaian ports. Um, by, making, by equipping Ghanaian ports with nodes to, the, to a um, overarching blockchain, we could record when um, who's like putting recycle um, e-waste into the Ghanaian ports, um, and then when that when those e-wastes are collected by the ground transportation, the ground transportation would be uh, equipped with nodes as well. Uh, they would record where that waste ends up, either in proper processing, repair, refurbish, reselling, or dump and burn. Um, as a result, you can see the starting destination where this e-waste is coming from, and the end destination. So as a result, you can put the twos and twos together. You can see who's accountable for the e-waste that's occurring in Ghana. And um, you can also, you can, as a result, have concrete data and evidence to take administrative action against the, the perpetrators of e-waste in Ghana. In the end, blockchain creates accountability, transparency, and trust. With this system in mind, the global community is incentivized to create a safer, more cleaner world for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a good question. I'd say that we're looking at recyclables, right? Not really waste. So at the end of the day, like the amount that they recycle, the net of that, that's really like how much we're considering in terms of factoring that into the amount of government aid that they're receiving. So whether it fluctuates, it's really just lumped together at the end of the day. So yeah. Thank you. Next, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ashvi Patel and Rafaelo Skenda. Close? Close enough. Uh, from Lebeau College, uh, talking about su sustainable aviation fuel. We have one, one hiccup. Hi, my name is Ashvi Patel, and I'm a finance major at Lebeau College. Hello, guys. My name is Rafael Skandari, and I am also a finance major at Lebeau. And today, we will be discussing sustainable aviation fuel. So first, let's go into the need for it. What exactly is the environmental waste we are countering with SAF? So first off, jet fuel emissions have been increasing the carbon dioxide, sulfur oxide, and black carbon in the atmosphere. And the aviation industry actually produced 2.4% of the global carbon dioxide emissions in 2018, according to the EPA. So there's a clear increase in greenhouse gases due to jet fuel emissions. So our product, which is SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, would be a clean substitute for fossil jet fuels. 
It would be made from feedstocks like waste oils, which could include like cooking oils. It could be made from agricultural residues, which would include rice husk or corn stover. And it would also be made from non-fossil carbon dioxide, which can come from decomposition, ocean release, and photosynthesis. Solid waste, such as packaging and paper, as well as forestry waste, such as um, wood, can also contribute to making SAF. And the great thing about SAF is that it's versatile. You can put as, suppliers can put as much or as little SAF and blend it with their fossil jet fuel. And that can help minimize costs. And this would require no special infrastructure or equipment. So it would be very versatile and buildable in the aviation industry. All right, as Ashley spoke about SAF and what it is in general, how it's made and how it's used, we're going to talk about some of the benefits that SAF brings to the people in our society today. Um, so we have several benefits from energy security to economic development and improved air quality. But the most crucial one that we're going to talk about is the 50% aviation biofuel mixture which can cut air traffic caused by pollution by 57 to 80% according to NASA. That is a mouthful. Um, so this is, I say this, is, we say this is the most crucial one because it brings both economic development and improved air quality to the table. Um, a 50% aviation biofuel mixture would be, be rather inexpensive as 100% because it will be um, more cheaper and f as well as more improved air, air quality. Not to mention that if it was 100%, it would be relatively 100 bi hundreds and billions of dollars, but if it was rather 50%, it would be rather six to $10 billion. So going off what we said in the previous slide, we have a cost, cost analysis set up. So current jet fuel today comes for 22% of airline expenses today. And implementing SAF in just 5% of the airline industry would cost, as I said previously, just $6.5 billion. And in the long term, only 2% of SAF in the fuel industry will be more cost efficient. And if you see on the right our graph, so as I go over, the light blue is fossil jet kerosene, which is the current jet fuel that most airlines use today. Um, the dark blue is SAF, which is the type of fuel or jet fuel that airlines would like to implement. And the green dot is the, is the dot that is that put on the graph is the, the represent the percentage of SAF from which airlines use today. So projections have it that by 2025, there will be, there will be at least between 4 to 8% of SAF implemented to airline industry. But it is projected that by 2040, that at least 20% of SAF will be implemented. And that itself will be a great milestone. Yeah, and in terms of cost efficiency, we're talking about instead of um, our idea is to gradually introduce SAF and build um, it into the aviation industry so it's more cost efficient. So we're going to take a look at corporate contribution. How do airline companies um, contribute to implementing SAF worldwide? So first off, United Airlines actually uses 3 million gallons of SAF a year in their LA International Airport's fuel supply for the past three years. And they have a contract with World Energy to buy 10 million gallons of SAF. So they're taking an actual initiative, an actual step to implementing and using SAF. On the other side, we have Delta Airlines and Boeing, which have both invested into the SAF industry. Delta Airlines has signed an agreement with the Northwest Advanced Biofuels to um, implement SAF, whereas Boeing has invested $1 million into the Brazilian SAF industry. Um, as important as uh, corporations are, government contribution is equally necessary because their policies and regulations would allow for um, SAF to be used and more prominent. So first off, Canada introduced the Sky's the Limit Challenge, which would motivate domestic participants to find new ways to implement SAF. Um, and their goal is to fuel 10% of Air Canada and WestJet flights with made in Canada biojet fuel. Um, Indonesia also included SAF on their state action plan and has a national aviation biofuel implementation roadmap. So what this means is they have an actual agenda for how they want to introduce SAF and a plan for how much SAF they want to introduce per year or in the next two, three years. Um, with, by creating deadlines, they are actually setting an initiative up. The US has increased required renewable fuel in transportation from 9 billion gallons in 2008 to 36 billion gallons in 2020. 
So this increase gives room for SAF to be more prominently used in the U.S. and to be uh, considered a renewable fuel in the aviation industry. So with any innovative uh, idea, there are, of course, drawbacks. Some of the drawbacks that we have, we have, we are going to present to you today are range from economic to cultural. So some of the economic um, drawbacks is that it is extremely expensive. As we've shown you guys previously, it, takes, it will be a f just 5% of SAF to be implemented into the airline industry. It will cost at least $6.5 billion. It could be more as there's, it's still in trial run. However, implementing it in total airline industry could range from 100 to at least a quarter of a trillion dollars, which, which itself could be a huge cost of factory airlines and could possibly put some airlines out of, um, out of uh, production. And it also harms the environment because you also need factories to produce SAF. And as I said, we're still in the trial run phase. So as airlines try to test SAF, there will be rather more there will be rather more pollution factors as as any kind of guaranteed results. But of course, there are solutions to these issues, and some of the solutions that we have is we are going to present you in our future outlook. So of course, there is the goal of carbon neutral growth, which is increasing which is the business increasing its production without increasing emissions. And that is the goal for any kind of business today. The plan, the plan by the airline industry is a half emissions by 2050. And on the chart on the left here, we have, we have biofuels for every industry from airline to cars to even home. And the one that we're gonna focus on is the one on the left, which is biojet, which is the light yellow. So when this study was conducted in 2012, it was biojet, um, Biojet emissions were at a, um, or the, the demand for biojet was at a low, but the projections have it by that by 2050, we have at least 30, between 30 to 35 percent of biojet, bio, sorry, biojet will be in demand, and estimated 13 million tons of SAF will be implemented by 2030, and this will result in 35 million tons of CO2 um, being saved. And the great thing is, previously, um, they were trying to develop the SAF product and trying to make it the best it could be. But now the product is finalized, and it's all about which companies, which governments are willing to take the initiative to implement it. So with that, we'd like to thank our professor, Ms. Jody Cataline, as well as the Global Classroom, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's both. That was a combined like um, okay. amount. But that was done in 2012, and we're already at 2020 right now. So um, there's still time to go, and they're probably going to fix the analysis as well. So thank you very much. It's only showing me a quarter of the screen. I'll be launching it. IT timeout. Okay, that should be good. You're good. Um, our last speaker is Olivia Spratt from Keone uh, Honors College. Uh, Olivia will talk about the climbing up cycle. How do I use them? I can use this one. Like this whole thing? Oh, there it is. How do I? Hello, my name is Olivia Spratt, and I um, am in the custom design major program studying sustainable food systems. Um, so this is actually my senior capstone research um, where I was creating a definition for the term upcycled food um, so that it could be used as a universal understanding in the industry. So upcycled food is a way to deal with food waste. Um, 
Just some background on food waste. Um, it is a huge global issue. Some USDA um, stats would be that it's estimated that 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. food supply is wasted annually. Um, and thir there's a 31 percent loss in retail and consumer sectors. Um, in 2010, 133 billion pounds and 161 billion dollars worth of food that was produced uh, for consumption was wasted. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that this happens. A lot of it comes down to just spoilage um, in every sector of the uh, food chain. Um, and this can happen because of improper transportation or inefficiencies in manufacturing, um, improper storage, packaging, um, especially of perishable foods. And there's also a lot of over-ordering in the retail sector. We have this idea that supermarkets should be really abundant with food. So they tend to over-purchase, and then a lot of that food goes to waste, especially perishable items. Um, and then there's also over-purchasing in the consumer sector as well, people that are buying too much food and then they don't end up cooking it and it gets thrown out. Um, so solutions to food waste. The number one solution would obviously be to reduce the waste at the source, reduce the amount of waste that's being produced. And this can be done by, uh, through product development, producing foods that um, are less perishable, um, different storage techniques, different packaging techniques, developing packaging that preserves food for a longer amount of time, um, labeling, having a more universal understanding of expiration dates, um, and cooking methods, being able to understand how to cook with your food waste in, on a consumer level and then also in a retail um, space or in a restaurant or something like that. Um, so that's obviously the number one way to reduce food waste, but when that can't be done, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has developed this food waste recovery um, hierarchy. So the number one best thing to do would be to reduce um, the source, but if that can't be done, the next best thing to do is to feed hungry people with food waste. So that means recovering um, food waste and uh, maybe donating it to hunger relief organizations or cooking with it or something like that. Um, and then if this can't be done, the next best thing would be to feed um, animals. And then if it's inedible food, industrial uses such as biofuel or um, bioplastics. And then composting <coughs> and landfill would be like the lower end of use for food. Um, so the solution that I've been working with would be upcycled food products. So this is a culinary solution to food waste. Um, I was working alongside the Upcycle Food Association, which is a group of um, upcyclers, people that work in manufacturing upcycled food products, and people that also just work in the space of um, using food waste for different problems. Um, and the one thing that was kind of universally understood is that upcycled food is food that uses ingredients that would have otherwise gone to waste. But other than that, there wasn't like a strong or detailed understanding of what an upcycled food would be and what it would mean in the marketplace. So for my research, I used the Delphi method, um, which consisted of um, multiple rounds of interviews and questionnaires um, and surveys with targeted at a specific group of experts. So in this case, it was members of the Upcycle Food Association. Um, and I started off with interviews to gather some more like qualitative data um, and just talking to them about their companies and what they're doing in the food waste space and then also um, what they think upcycled food is and what it should mean and what the term should mean in the industry. Um, so these are some of the companies that I um, spoke with just to give you a better understanding of what upcycling even is. Um, Phil Abundance and the Bacon Jam Gourmet work together on an upcycled product. Phil Abundance has their own um, upcycling brand called Abundantly Good. Um, but they work together to make a spiced tomato jam using surplus tomatoes um, off of farms. And then that product is um, sold or donated to people in need. Um, and the money from that goes back to the farmer to encourage them to be able to produce more and to be able to um, deal with the loss that happens a lot of times when they're with their surplus um, harvest. And then Regrained is a company that makes granola bars out of the spent grain after brewing beer. They're really high in fiber and that spent grain usually just goes to um, compost or landfill. 
And then Renewal Mill is a company that uses soybean pulp from soy milk um, manufacturing. That pulp is really, really high in fiber also, so they dry it and they make it into a flour that can then be made into baked goods or used however you would use a normal flour. Um, so in conclusion, we found from interviewing people working in this space that um, some of the like, most common themes that came up in the interviews was that upcycled food um, uses food that would have otherwise been wasted. It's for human consumption. It's a value-added product, meaning that um, that can mean a couple different things. There's economic value added to the product, but there's also the value added when you're moving um, an ingredient up the hierarchy, the EPA hierarchy. So you're taking a product that normally would have been used for animal feed or um, composted or put in the landfill and you're making that fit for human consumption. Um, it was also kind of universally decided that the food product should move the ingredient up the EPA uh, recovery hierarchy and also that it should have an overall positive effect on the environment. Obviously a lot of times that comes from reducing food waste but also just practices within the company of being mindful of how you're using resources and what waste you're producing in making that secondary product. Um, and then from the survey, so we used these common themes and developed a survey to get more um, qualitative data on what is like really, really important to people, or quantitative data. Um, and we found that the top three things would be upcycled foods have a positive effect on the environment, they move the food up the EPA hierarchy, and they have tangible benefits to society. So I'm still working on creating the final definition, but those are the three um, most important things that are going to be incorporated into that definition. So yeah, thank you. It is. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where composting is really beneficial. It's not something that you should be telling people not to do, obviously. Um, and I think especially on like a consumer level, it makes a lot of sense to compost. Of course, compost overthrowing things in the landfill. Um, but then there's also ways to think about using food waste. Like if you're cooking and you have all these scraps, like instead of just immediately composting them, how can you make that into a different meal or something like that? So I think that's something to think about. All right, go ahead. One more question. I have a question about like regional markets for the food waste. Like, there's this uh, website I know with uh, the actual participates in the U.S. Uh, field, uh, not whatever. It's like overstock stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there like a clearing house for food waste in any region? Like, you go a Monday to be a lot of the place where you go a couple times with this or that, and you come together and then you be, you know, available for uh, people to think about. Right. Um, I don't know if the infrastructure for that is in place. I guess fill abundance would be um, a way to go, but I don't know for sure. They're, they're pretty focused. I've dealt with them. They're pretty focused on what they can immediately turn around within their food yeah. network. They don't think about other products. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I actually worked at Phil Abundance and they do have um, their own like upcycled food line. And so they work mainly with dairy farmers. Their model's a little bit different, but they source um, like surplus um, product from dairy farmers, and then they make a cheese that's then donated. Um, but then they also make a cheese that's sold in like specialty food stores for a good amount. So then that money can go back to the farmer, and then the farmer has more leeway with producing their milk. Yeah. Right. So right now I'd like to call the main speakers to come up to the table here, and then we can have a discussion here. So go right ahead. Come on up. So um, I'd like to ask a question for the panel just to start off. In, in, in overall, minimizing waste. 
it's a balance between how do you balance technology versus human actions. What's more important? The way the technology or the change in human behavior? What's your view? Go ahead. Whoever wants to step up first. Um, okay, so I would say that. Speak into the microphone. Yeah. The, I think the best thing about technology is that it's motivated by humans. It's motivated by the people who are willing to put into the time to better the technology. So if you don't have that human motivation, if you don't have the people power, then there's like, there won't be that exact like increase in technology and like that impact on waste. Anybody else want to? I'm just going to say the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, I would agree. Any questions for the, the panel? I mean, I guess what I was talking about earlier with like, um, I mean, this is kind of what I've studied for the past four years, so I'm really cognizant of it. And I think if I'm cooking and like there's scraps, then I'll find a way to use them. And just little things like that, like throughout the day. Any more, any, any questions for the panel? I'll add on to that. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, just overall, just being like conscious of how much you're using like at the end of the day, just like, you know, making sure that you finish all the food on your plate at the end of the day, just making sure that you're not like throwing away things that you shouldn't be like, just, just building it, build it into my nature has really been something that is how I, you know, expand upon those values. I um, also wanted to include like a lot of times waste isn't what you necessarily think. Um, <coughs> one group in my um, class did something along the lines of fashion and the waste in clothing. And so I think a good idea would be like, if you're not wearing certain clothes, right, you could donate it, you can always like um, change it up a little, which I think is cool. And like fast fashion is a huge thing now. So um, instead of like just, you know, going through clothes, buying new ones, it's always good to look at what you have, change it up or donate. Um, and as we talked about in ours about like water waste and bottled water, I definitely try to like not use and buy bottled plastic water, I usually just refill it on campus and I do have a Brita filter although I'm trying to find other alternatives because it is not like the most waste effective. Okay, we can actually see the waste at our table here. <laughs> now, plastic cups. This is something that you know, we should all take, you know, use here at the university to try to minimize whatever they can. Um, one other question uh, that I have. If, um, what do you think is the most important thing society can do to re re reduce the amount of waste? Um, well, I would say that it's like a cultural thing. Um, like even when I was just talking about with grocery stores, I know from working at Phil Abundance that um, grocery store managers and people that are buying food for grocery stores, they think that it looks bad like within that community to like not have fully stocked shelves all the time and not have more than you need for the store. Um, they want to be buying surplus all the time and that's because consumers expect to go into a store and they don't want to see the shelves empty. Um, they want to see like tons and tons of produce and I think that is just like a um, capitalist mentality that we have of like always having surplus. So I think just like a different um, mentality with that would be very important. Um, I think additionally, um, I just definitely shifting the blame. I think now with waste, there's a definitely uh, there's a blame of the community and individual people. And although you can make a, a change in your life, changing the mentality, um, like Olivia said, and changing sort of society's ideas of what waste is, and take using accountability and like ch and looking at companies and the government for better waste practices is very important. I think also like uh, when it comes to like everyday usage, um, that's what's going to make the most difference. So um, I know for like Drexel um, in the dining centers, they do a lot of like uh, paper straws now. They don't do plastic straws and that like when you take into account a huge university doing something like that, like it makes a bigger difference. So I think and then every day, like when you drink, um, 
you're using paper instead of the plastic, so that makes a difference. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's about empathy, just kind of like feeling the impacts of your actions and understanding that at the end of the day, like you're contributing to um, waste if you're like, you know, um, being wasteful on your own. So like just kind of like building it into your nature and um, ensuring that like, you know, you're conscious with every action you make, the impact that it has, uh, it really adds up. And so it's like a society-wide thing. You know, if we can like really educate and, you know, ensure that people understand the impacts of their actions, it can have like a pretty large effect at the end of the day. And I also think, um, kind of what Tace was just saying, changing the way you're thinking about what waste is. Like I know when we were just coming up with the term upcycled and like thinking that would be what we applied to this sort of food manufacturing, you can't, people don't want to hear that it's made with food waste. Like waste is just like a very, people have very specific ideas of what that means. And I think a lot of times it means something that's not useful anymore. Um, and that's not necessarily true all the time. So. Um, I also wanted to add that um, a lot of the times with waste, people think, oh, to counter waste, um, you know, government or like corporations need to pour more money into it. But sometimes when you take, like, for example, with the straws, like um, metal straws came around, and that just created a whole new industry for people who want, like, the Save the Turtle, the straws, all the Instagram, the social media coverage around it. So that increased, like, um, the demand for that kind of product. So I think it's also helpful in that way, too. It's time for one question I saw in the back. Right. Um, that's obviously tough. I don't, I don't really know how you would influence a restaurant to do that. I guess just consumer feedback is always important. Um, I've worked in restaurants where they did have a composting program, and I think that there are a lot of restaurants that want to look, to appear, and to also want to be more sustainable, but really want the consumers to see that they're being sustainable. So, um, see that they're using locally sourced produce or um, reducing their food waste or composting or these sort of things. So I think like the more that consumers want that from a restaurant, the more that they would be willing to do that. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panel very much. One statistic that I stopped putting my shop in this year. Every three days, it goes to the Oh, these are old ones now? I can close these? Okay.
Right. Well, actually, and there's lunch from 1 to 1.30. 1 1 1.30, right? Yeah. Okay. I can just do this one. I mean, I don't mind doing this one. But I told him to be back by 12.30. Yeah, I told him But there's lunch at 1, so that would be fruit, fruitless anyway. Uh, I'm just... Yeah, that's fine. I don't know why... Um, I don't know what he did. <laughs> But I guess he's got it on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he's got it extended, and it was only getting one quarter of that screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I would say screw that. And uh, I'm just put it on do. That's what I was trying to do, but I thought it was in uh, display settings. And I can use it for seven. Oh wait, no. Wait. Yeah, you can go too. I'm like, let's see. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Okay. okay. And I'm not caring. Um, can you actually do me a favor and go make sure it's full screen there? Thanks. Sorry, just go. I don't know what he did. Is it full screen? Nothing? Oh, wait. Make sure the IP is okay. It's a big day for you, huh? What's that mean? Oh. Yeah. It's a different IP. Yeah, I don't have a list of like the other presenters, so I'm just gonna have them. Do you have slides for me? Is that what you're waiting for? Okay. How do I do this again? Sorry, we have a presenter issue there. Do I dance? Thank you. Do you like robots? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> Reba! Hi! Which one is it? Uh, do you have any cool connections? Uh, I do not. I think I actually mentioned as a group when I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Joe. You contain multitudes. <laughs> yeah, there's a clicker here that belongs to them. They can show you how to use that. And then let me give you this back. I try to keep this in my like. Okay, that's good. That's good. I won't tell anybody. I won't tell anybody. And if I think I'm speaking to you, I think I just hit the right by accident. Rita, slow down a little bit. Oh, maybe not. Can you back it up? Uh, yeah, I'll just go like that. Uh, okay. I'm gonna try to be Yeah, I think I think the the thing is heard something. Talk quickly. Oh, going just by the stop. sound. I'm sorry. Yes. Give a beat. Yes. Sorry, it's like really dirty. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Shana, so Yes, and I was wondering, is it possible I could do presenter mode when I present? Honestly, no, because we're live streaming, and I need to have the screens duplicated in order to capture the slides, because I can't switch back and forth between presenters, unfortunately. Okay. I'm sorry. Would I be able to have my computer next you can, to this? You can, you want, yeah. Yeah. That would be an okay solution? If you can, that would yeah, be great, yeah, because it's been a mess, like, all morning okay. because of the different styles that yeah, people have been definitely. presenting it. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, sorry. How many more slides are there? Um, there's one more. And 
minutes one. Yep, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Is that this one is you, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome.
how do I do that? Um, well, do you have like a zip drive or do you have a zip drive? Can I email it to myself? Yeah, you can email it. Okay. Will it be up there while I'm like putting it up? Like logging into my email and all that? I can see if I can
Uh, welcome back to the Student Conference on Global Challenges. Our panel uh, this afternoon is on global justice and human rights. Uh, we have a great diversity of uh, students and panels uh, and, and um, approaches and talks. And so I'm going to um, not talk too much about them, but let them introduce themselves, uh, who, who's uh, their co-collaborators. Um, and our fir very first talk is um, uh, about su sustaining community, the fair trade solution. Uh, please welcome Mary Grace Cornell um, Combs to the stage. My name is Mary Grace Cornell Combs. I'm a freshman here at Drexel. I'm a marketing major. These are my teammates. Hi everyone, my name is Callie Charlesworth. I'm also a freshman and my major is international business. Hi, I'm Jordan Gallagher. I'm a freshman as well and my major is finance and business analytics. I'm Sasha Wilson. I'm a freshman and I'm currently undecided in business. And today we're going to be talking about fair trade and how it impacts cultures and communities. All right. So fair trade began in 1946 when Americans and Europeans began traveling to developing countries. They noticed that artisans were having a very difficult time selling their products because no one was purchasing from them. They then decided to take the products that artisans were making and sell them in their own countries of America and Europe in order to find the market that was able to purchase them. The travelers marked up the prices in order to make a profit and then traveled back to the developing countries to pay the artisans for what they had sold. While they were there, there are obvious issues with this process because people would not pay back the artisans and other issues arose. So they needed guidelines and fair trade was born. Our group focused our research on coffee, so it's interesting to note that it was the first fair trade product in 1988. The main goal of fair trade is to bring about improved and sustainable trade relationships. These trade relationships involve developed countries and the companies that they work in, and the producers in undeveloped countries. Um, this happens in order to ensure that the producers earn adequate and livable wages and no one is taking advantage of them. Yeah, and one um, term that we kind of came up with for this was the community economy. And while we were doing our research, we found a really good definition that we liked. So a community economy is spaces of collective action where in striving to create livable worlds, groups are actively reshaping their economic practices, identities, and exchanges. So basically, our view of fair trade and the whole economic practice of it is making ethical and informed economic decisions to keep communities together. The main goal of fair trade is the future progression of sustainability and rights for the, all of the components of the production chain. It is a growing international trend in our modern world. It also happens to ensure equality and to combat injustices such as poverty. Um, concerning the business aspect of fair trade, it prioritizes people and the planet over the importance of profit. <laughs> um, so to be fair trade certified, there are high standards that must be met to ensure proper compensation to workers. So third party auditors conduct evaluations where they track transactions along the supply chain and once the, pro once the product is approved, they receive a fair trade certified seal, which is visible on all products. Um, currently, there are over 6,000 fair trade certified products, and these range from produce to clothing to beauty care to beverages, so it's very diverse. And one um, benefit of this from a business standpoint is that it allows market access, enabling buyers to trade with producers who would otherwise be excluded from this international market. So as a part of being fair trade certified, there is a premium that you are required to pay, and this is a percentage of the product's profits that must be allocated to farmers and workers. And this sum of money is intended to be used as investment to improve life quality of the workers. It is recalculated every three to four years to adjust for inflation, and the monetary value of the premium depends on the product. So how are these premiums spent? Within each production site, uh, the workers form a cooperative and they elect representatives. It is the responsibility of these representatives to decide on premium investments and the percentage of each investment. Some products do have a requirement for their investments. For example, coffee must allocate at least 25% of its premium towards enhancing quality and productivity. But typically, committees um, choose investment projects that will be beneficial to the workers, their families, and their surrounding communities. Um, some examples of, product, of um, projects range from housing to water to electricity to education. 
So when we were obviously starting this project, we were really interested in the people and the community behind the fair trade movement. So our case study we found was in Chiapas, Mexico with a cooperative called Maya Vinic, which means the Mayan people. So they're indigenous farmers and they're kind of trying to rem remain autonomous from oppressive governments and their economic strategy is fair trade coffee. Obviously you can't really eat and live off of coffee. I've tried, <laughs> it doesn't work very well. So they're traditionally like farmers who grow land, who grow agriculture to eat and survive. So it's really their economic strategy to raise awareness for their, their struggles and sustain their communities. And two people that we found who really also believed in this movement were Chris Treat and Matt Early. They founded a Fair Trade Chronicles kind of video series on YouTube. If you want to take a minute to check it out, it's really, really interesting. So there are several limitations that are placed on fair trade. The first one being that there are stereotypes placed around the word marginalized. So the general public's ability to understand what or who produces fair trade products is kind of not fully like developed. So many people think of it as an unimportant or powerless position when in reality the people within fair trade, the growers and the managers believe that consumers prefer their products because they're from family farming enterprises. Also, fair trade was founded to benefit small producers of coffee and other commodities. Um, and as it has evolved, it's placed an emphasis on tailoring its efforts to the needs and aspirations of consumers. So this has created a divide in the past within fair trade, but um, it has enabled more companies to get involved within the fair trade movement. It can also be viewed as a capitalist practice because of how uh, money driven they are and money motivated they are, um, as well as the way that they set their prices for supply and demand, which um, can be a downside. Um, and another limitation is the limited customer base. So since fees are high and workers earn competitive rates, fair trade products have premium prices associated with them that are uh, compared to regular products outside this market. So higher prices weigh on consumers who live paycheck to paycheck and make it uh, typically, or they typically cause them to choose a cheaper product of a similar quality. And although fair trade is growing, many people don't truly know what it is. So the risk, or this risks this carrot a distance mentality, which is when people buy the products because they feel like they're accomplishing something or contributing to a good cause, but they don't actually know how or why it's good. There's also a potential profit loss within fair trade, or especially towards uncompetitive domestic firms, because tariffs are designed to help domestic firms which produce at a higher cost than international competitors, but in fair trade they could see a fall in demand which could put them out of business. Um, there's also a lot of costs in fair trade, so there's like a certified organization fee to become fair trade certified. Uh, there's further annual fees to maintain being fair trade certified. Um, and there's an annual fee of units sold for around $1 per pound for coffee. So since coffee is a whole and pure product, each uh, or every step of the growing and packaging process has to be certified, which can add up to a lot of costs. Yeah, so overall fair trade is really a difficult movement because it takes an economic change as well and that's really different from our consumer culture and the economic strategy that we implement in our lives today. So that's what we wanted to talk to you guys about. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Um, we'll hold our questions to the after all the panelists have, have given their presentations. Um, our next um, talk is called Community Driven Solutions to Global Challenges, Naloxone Distribution in Philadelphia Communities. Please welcome Shraddha Damaraju to the stage. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shraddha. I'm a third year medical student at uh, Drexel College of Medicine. Um, which button is it? Oh, it's this one. Okay. So, um, 
Today I'm going to be talking about uh, community-driven solutions to global challenges, naloxin distribution in Philadelphia communities. So um, this is a project that I conducted um, through Drexel College of Medicine with, uh, through a partnership with uh, Philly Department of Public Health. Um, so first of all, we all know from the news um, that the opioid epidemic is a growing problem. Um, it's a huge issue not only in Philadelphia but worldwide, um, and it's becoming more and more at the forefront of um, you know, the world stage as, you know, an issue that needs to be tackled. Um, so just to focus specifically on Philadelphia for a moment. So, um, you know, this map is, is showing uh, where, you know, non-fatal and fatal overdoses are happening in the city of Philadelphia. And while there are hot spots, um, you know, so right here in the middle is Kensington. Um, and, you know, there's a lot going on in South Philly. There's a lot going on in Northeast Philly. But really what these maps show is that, you know, there's not one part of Philadelphia that's untouched by um, opioid overdoses. Um, and these numbers are growing. So in 2017, we had over 1,200 deaths in the city alone due to um, drug overdoses. And the number went down a little bit in 2018, um, down to about 1,100. But still, um, you know, the level, of, um, the level of disease burden and the level of death is um, increasing, as you can see by this graph. So that's just the, the number of overdoses by year. Um, and it's not just a problem in Philadelphia. So, um, you know, the opioid epidemic is increasingly um, touching the rest of the world. So this map is showing um, the death rate from opioid overdoses. And you can see that United States has an incredibly high death rate, um, as do parts of Canada. But it's not just North America. It's also parts of Africa. It's parts of Europe. It's Russia. It's Australia. Um, so really, this is kind of extending across the globe. Um, and opioids account for the highest number of deaths from illicit drug overdoses. Um, and in 2017, about 40 million people were dependent on opioids, and over 100,000 people worldwide died from opioid overdose. So, um, you know, this is, this is a huge problem. And it's not just overdose, and it's not just loss of life. Um, the opioid epidemic contributes a lot to waste and economic burden um, due to, you know, loss of productivity, cost of treatment, criminal justice system. There's a lot of waste that, um, you know, that happens when we don't address this problem. Um, so according to the CDC, um, you know, just the economic burden of prescription opioid misuse alone is $78.5 billion. Um, and, you know, that doesn't account for other substances. That doesn't account for illicit drug use. Um, and, you know, this graph is showing the Medicaid costs associated with opioid use disorder. And, you know, you can see that it's just skyrocketing. So um, definitely this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So just to switch gears a little bit, so this is kind of an overwhelming problem, and there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, by far, the most important way and the most effective way that we can approach the opioid epidemic and drug use in general is harm reduction. So, um, you know, the harm reduction is a philosophy that's aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. It's like a practical solution, and, you know, we know that drug use happens. Um, you know, we're not living in a vacuum. It's, it's about meeting people where they're at. It's about, you know, reducing the harms associated with their drug use and, you know, being there with open arms to help whenever people are ready. Um, and, you know, it's really rooted in a belief um, for, you know, the rights of people who use drugs um, and respect for the people who use drugs. And I really like this graphic. It's from UNHRC. And it's just saying, like, people who use drugs do not lose their human rights. They deserve a safe supply. They deserve, you know, safe ways to use drugs. They deserve non-judgmental care. So that's really the core of what harm reduction is. And that's the new way, really, to address, um, you know, any public health solution, but especially drug use. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different examples of harm reduction. Um, you know, outside of, um, outside of drug use, seat belts, that's a really good example of harm reduction. There's inherent risk associated with, you know, driving a car, but that doesn't mean we don't go out and drive cars. We just use a seat belt and we reduce the risk associated with driving. So that's like an everyday example of harm reduction. Um, so, you know, in the context of um, drug use, you know, harm reduction constitutes syringe exchanges. So I don't know if you guys have heard of Prevention Point in Kensington. It's a very big, um, it's one of the only syringe exchanges in Pennsylvania. It provides clean works for people who use drugs, so it minimizes the spread of infection. Um, fentanyl testing strips, overdose prevention sites, which have been in the news a lot lately. Um, medication-assisted treatment, and community naloxone distribution. So, um, you know, multiple studies have proven that 
uh, when you distribute naloxone in communities and you teach people how to, um, how to use it and how to reverse overdoses, um, that's been proven to reduce death in communities, which seems obvious, but you know, that's one of, the, one of the major things that we do in harm reduction. So that leads me to this project. So the first phase, phase of this project was really to identify high-risk um, communities in Philadelphia who are suffering from a disproportionately high number of overdoses. So this is kind of just like a picture of um, the software OD map that we used, um, you know, available through the Philly Department of Public Health that collects all of this data. Um, so. We identified um, the areas of, this, uh, of the city that were experiencing a disproportionate number of overdoses, and we really tried to um, focus on finding community partners in those areas. Um, we were pretty much looking for anybody who was willing to host a training, but we ended up finding a lot of community development corporations, civic associations, libraries, high schools, you know, basically any community organization that's willing to um, engage with us. So the next phase of this project was so we had a cohort of about 60 Drexel medical students who um, were going to conduct these trainings. So the premise of the project was to find community partners in those high-risk areas, partner them with Drexel medical students who were going to conduct the trainings, and then distribute naloxone into those communities. Um, so we wanted to create a curriculum to make sure that whoever was going out to train was, you know, well informed in harm reduction, you know, social justice as it relates to drug use, stigma, sensitive language, um, and ultimately how to actually reverse overdoses and conduct an overdose reversal training. So this is just kind of a description of um, what the curriculum was made of, um, and ultimately. Um, you know, we were able to find 16 community partners all over Philly who are in these high-risk areas. Um, we trained about 60 DUCOM students um, to partner with these, uh, with these organizations and conduct these trainings. Um, and the Philly Department of Public Health uh, actually gave us Narcan to hand out at these trainings, so we were able to hand out about 240 doses of naloxone um, into the community. And ultimately, we trained hundreds of people in, you know, life-saving um, overdose reversal and naloxone administration. So, um, you know, conclusions from this project. So, like we talked about, the opioid epidemic is a huge problem and it's only getting worse. Um, but really the way to approach it is harm reduction um, because people who use drugs have fundamental human rights that must be respected. We have to meet them where they are. And one way to do that is to teach other people around them to save their lives, to teach them, you know, how to use naloxone um, because everybody's life is worth saving. Um, and ultimately, community connections are really important. So in any public health project, any type of information that needs to be disseminated, um, I think community connections are the way to go. It's definitely, um, you know, a very quick way to make something happen. And communities are the most important part, I think, of public health. Um, and I just want to acknowledge um, Allison. She's somewhere in the audience, somewhere. Um, Oh, she's back there. <laughs> so she's the um, harm reduction coordinator for the city. Um, she handles all the Narcan for Philadelphia, and um, she was a huge part of this project. Um, and everyone else listed here, a um, bunch of people and organizations. And yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, our next talk is titled NGOs and International Development Projects, an Overview of the Waste Involved. Please welcome Reva Swedler. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Reva Swedler. I am a super senior fifth year global studies student. <laughs> um, and today I'm going to attempt in this short amount of time to just introduce the relationship between non-governmental organizations and international development projects. Um, what I'm going to be introducing is not necessarily my own research, my own work, but it 
integrating my personal opinions within the large literature review that I did. Um, and I just want to point out some of the inefficiencies between this relationship um, that can often be a waste of time, resources, and efforts. Um, and again, before I begin, I actually just want to preface that the point of my talk is not to talk about whether international development projects in themselves are wasteful, um, but rather point out and critique some of the characteristics between this relationship and within these various stakeholders um, and the execution of the project itself that can be uh, more impactful and more successful. All right. So I wanted to just start with actually defining and explaining some of the terms I'm going to be using. So an NGO is a non-governmental organization. Um, this is a nonprofit entity that can range from environmental work to human rights. Um, an international development project is a form of international aid um, that can focus on things like education, health, and improving living standards. Um, throughout the years, NGOs have become more involved with international development projects because unlike government organizations, um, they can be perceived as more grassroots, um, more empathetic to vulnerable populations, more efficient and more effective, and especially with um, emergency relief aid. So what I'm presenting here is actually a very simplified linear skeleton of what I would say is the way that international development projects are funded. So it starts with the donors, which can be an individual organization, which is giving money to either a singular NGO or a group of them. Um, from this, they're going to use their organizational capacity and um, knowledge to kind of execute the project, which is the International Development Project, using money, resources, vision, and supervision, making sure that the project is being um, implemented correctly. Once the project's done, either the NGO will continue to move on or they will continue the project years in the future. Um, this oversimplification is very clean cut, but glazes over the reality of this transactional process. So what I've created here is what I think is like a little more realistic understanding of what's happening. Um, so it is the similar idea of money being passed over from the donors to the NGOs um, and then the money resources and vision being passed on to the international development projects. But what I've actually laid out here and within the three circles is the areas of inefficiencies. So between that donor NGO transaction within NGOs internally as well as within the groupings of NGOs and finally between the NGO and international development project relationship. Um, and this model actually also has, shows that there's benefits going the other way as well, um, which I'll go into more later. So I wanted to start with talking more, starting with the donors and the NGOs. Um, this talk is actually more focused on the the second and third part, but I think that this is something that needs to be addressed because none of this could happen without the money that's involved. Um, so there's actually a very interesting power dynamic that happens between the donors and the NGOs. So from the donor side, they want these tangible results. They want to see pictures of kids getting their books. They want to see schools being built. Um, and they're kind of less concerned with the long-term uh, benefits of these projects, the sustainability of them, and that they will continue to happen in the future. On the other hand, the NGOs feel very um, responsible and to satisfy the wishes of these donors. Um, they could maybe share the same vision as them, um, but now they feel kind of this huge pressure to perform and succeed. They want to keep getting funding for these projects. Um, so this can overwhelm the NGOs and they become very donor driven, which can make projects unnecessary and somewhat wasteful. Um, and also, to continue getting funding, the NGOs might need, feel a need to kind of fabricate their success by withholding a truth or scaling up their impact. Um, all of this is obviously negative and um, not helpful in the realm of things. So the second point of waste is within NGOs as well as amongst them. Um, so internally, um, NGOs don't 
as I was just saying, they don't have the stability of consistent funding. If they are a really popular and well-known NGO, great, they probably will, but most likely they don't. Um, so this makes their decisions very survival driven. They want to make sure that they can open their doors the next day and pay the people that are working for them. Um, so they end up spending a lot of money on organiza organizational and management costs. Um, this is not necessarily a critique. I want people to can you get, continue getting paid as well, um, but that diverts the attention from giving it to the actual project themselves. Um, additionally, there's a lot of um, waste involved with the lack of communication between NGOs. The, and there's not really a clear form of communication that's currently happening between them. Uh, this can be potentially very dangerous because there could be a lot of rec replicated projects as well as clustering of projects in certain geographical areas. Additionally, this lack of a common evaluation and rep um, evaluation our standards can make it hard for organizations to compare themselves to others. Um, so if they need a baseline data set, they might have to go and individually conduct them themselves, which is a huge amount of startup cost for them, which can be very detrimental to a very uh, low cost NGO. And finally, the third part of inefficiency, which I think is the most interesting, is between the NGO and the uh, international development project themselves. Um, the NGOs are tasked with a really difficult job of trying to implement a project in another country, which they're hoping to improve human well-being. Um, this can be very hard when they're not addressing the entire political, economic, and social sphere that's happening around them. Um, and I actually found a case study that I think would perfectly explain this. Um, so I'm going to use the case study to explain what I'm talking about. Um, so there's this clan, I'm going to mispronounce it, I think it's called Gi or Ni. Um, they're in Cameroon and there are various NGOs trying to work on the fact that there's a lot of problems with food security. So this study looked into the various missteps and ultimate failure of the Ni Integrated Rural Development Project which was sponsored by the Netherlands Development Organization. So overall the biggest problem with this entire NGO development project was that there was an inability to reach out and effectively consult with the targeted population on their needs as well as the general unwillingness to take advantage of the farmers knowledge. Initially the women who were most of the farmers were asked about their crop knowledge but the NGO ignored it bringing in plants that were from completely different environments. When those plants obviously failed they refused to listen to the input of the farmers and didn't solve their problem. When they went to evaluate the projects the NGO was actually not interested in the opinions of what the farmers had to say. Uh, they didn't use the opportunity to acknowledge the failure that they had come upon and chose to continue excluding the, win the women from their plans. They continued to be selfish and elitist and were unwilling to respect the culture or unwilling to empower the women themselves. The lack of proper cultural and training research was exemplified when the one crop, the Irish potatoes, did very well. They were not only not native to this area and somehow miraculously grew, but quickly became irrelevant as there was no local demand and no money to export the crop. Another big problem was the hidden agendas, lack of uh, participant clarity, and the finances involved. The farmers thought they were getting fertilizers and treatments for crop diseases, but instead were planting crops that they didn't have any um, prior knowledge of. Farmers felt they were being deceived because of the lack of transparency. This can be very detrimental in future projects down the line if a group has a bad association with a uh, foreign NGO. When these farmers had to obtain a loan, there, were ex there was exclusionary monetary prerequisites. So some of the farmers couldn't even get the loan because they weren't able to put up upfront money. Subsequently, some farmers thought the supplies were free, but because they signed a paper, despite being illiterate, declaring that it was a loan, they were forced to repay the cost with money that they didn't actually have. So throughout this whole process, there was a lack of valuation and bad supervision, and ultimately all these factors that I've just laid out to you was the reason that it failed. So finally, I've come up with a more cohesive and possibly a uh, better, uh, better understanding of things that could be taken into account when trying to reduce the waste. So between the donor and NGO relationship, there will always be money, there needs to be funding. However, what about maybe more of compromised expectations or a long-term commitment so they, the NGOs can feel security in what they're doing? 
Between the NGOs and the International Development Project, the money and resources and supervision can, can continue, but what about empowering people, employing the locals into the project, education, better research and consultation, and taking constructive feed up, feedback, and most of all, being respectful? Between the International Development Project and the NGOs, Possibly they could have more of a platform to give advice and not about the knowledgeable topics, get involved, continue supporting the project once the NGO leaves the area, or um, continue corralling local interest and cooperation. Within NGOs, there needs to be a form of standardization and communication to continue um, being productive. And finally, between the NGOs and donors, to balance out more of this unequal power balance, Maybe have more of compromised expectations as well as transparency in the reporting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Riva. Our next um, talk is uh, titled Focusing in on Child Abandonment in e Swatini. The Guava Project. Please welcome Jerusalem Tamir. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerusalem, and I am a pre junior economics student here at Drexel. Um, I had the opportunity of being a co op Dorns Life Global Development Scholar last spring, and I had the opportunity to travel to Eswatini. Um, and I got to do really cool work with World Vision, um, and I ended up focusing in on child abandonment. So before I jump in, I kind of want to explain how I reached um, child abandonment in Eswatini. So as a scholar heading into the country, 17 hours of flying later, I was in Eswatini, and I was there thinking it's now I have to produce something that's going to be long-term, something that the community will be able to use for um, a sustainable amount of time. So they wanted me to evaluate their maternal newborn child health and nutrition program and from then that is when I, um, through interacting with the people that were involved in the project, child abandonment repeatedly came up and this is really isn't something that's discussed in Eswatini. Um, so through that implementing World Vision's um, behavior, design for behavioral change um, framework, I was able to develop the Guava project. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So Eswatini, or formerly known as Swaziland, is a very small country in southern Africa. It has a population of around 1 million, a life expectancy of around um, 58 years, and also it's one of the last standing after. You know, talk about drug use, um, and you know, I, I think that naloxone should be available on every college campus, um, readily available, but um, it's difficult to penetrate like the university structure to, um, to try to make that happen, but that's definitely something that we are working on. And I think that's a really good thought. Um, no, but I would love to do more research on that. Um, I don't have any numbers, and I think that with more time I can do more research into that, but what I do know is that there is, there's always the expense of having a fundraiser because you want to, you want to be creating an event that's appealing to people and that people want to come to and give money to, but then you have the cost of actually putting on that production. Um, but to answer your question, I do not know the numbers. <laughs> but I will look that up after this. So um, it was actually a really interesting conversation to begin to facilitate um, at, like in the focus groups and in the interviews simply because when child abandonment usually happens, it's when children are, have, like, what are born out of wedlock. So that's already a, ta a taboo in the community. Um, and then raising those children, it's, there's a really big um, 
concern with of raising those children with um, if say the parents one of the parents remarry and they want to take that child into the new marriage it's not as accepted um, there there are certain beliefs that that child does not belong to the family or the child could harm the other children or simply the other parents in the new marriage doesn't want to have to take out the financial costs to take care of that child so it was definitely an interesting thing to bring up um, because surrounding that it also talks about we had to talk about um, sexual education we had to talk about um, prevention contraception and that so it was it was really interesting to have um, different focus groups so when I was talking to, with nurses nurses were open and they were ready to talk about it um, with the elderly community however a lot of them um, were raising children that were born out of wedlock so their kids so their grandchildren essentially and they were they were a little bit more wary but in the end they were able to talk about it with high school students however it was a big taboo because in high school you're not allowed to talk about um, just sexual education, contraception. So even mentioning those words in the high school, um, I did get a lot of like sly looks from students. They were like, what's going on here? But um, I do think that after a couple of focus groups, it was much more easier to facilitate the conversation and um, kind of understand the cultural barriers, even if I wasn't able to break those down. Absolutely. So, um, so a lot of the people in the harm reduction community, um, myself included, we we do like outreach to communities who use drugs. Um, you know, in South Philly and Kensington and, and a lot of other hotspots. Um, and one of the like one of the biggest things we do is hand out naloxone to people who are using drugs. Um, uh, simply because um, you know, out of everybody you know in this community structure, like they're the ones who know how to use Narcan best. They're the ones who immediately respond to other people overdosing. Like they really, really take care of each other, and they know, um, you know, they know how high the stakes are. So, um, you know, in a community like Kensington, when it's where it's happening um, very often, um, the first responder response is pretty quick. But um, you're absolutely right that you know the first people who are usually at the scene are people who are around the person who's overdosing and. Um, you know, it's really great when, I think Kensington is an example of like, everybody there knows how to use Narcan, everybody knows what Narcan is. Um, and then so, you know, as soon as um, an overdose is happening, like millions of people are there with like Narcan and like, oh, I can help with this, I can help with that. And it's actually like a very, um, it's an amazing response and I've seen it multiple times. Um, so, you know, ideally other communities would also follow that model. The more we distribute naloxone, the more we teach other people, community members become the first responders. Um, and definitely people who use drugs are, you know, at the front line and they, you know, they're the most educated about Narcan, they're the most educated about drugs, and, you know, they deserve that respect. Um, so, yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And so quick announcement, so now we're going to have lunch, um, but at 1.30 our keynote speaker, our second keynote speaker will be speaking in this room. So please grab your lunches as quickly as possible and try and get back in here for 1.30.
Taking a seat, um, again, I, I don't know if some of you were here this morning, but to reintroduce myself, my name is Casey Devine. I'm the coordinator for the Office of Global Engagement and Education Abroad, and it is my pleasure to introduce Nick Esposito to you, our second keynote speaker for the day. Nick Esposito is the Zero Waste and Litter Director for the City of Philadelphia. He served as a PowerCore PHL Project Manager for Philadelphia Parks and Recreation and then as their Sustainability Manager. He was selected by the Managing Director's Office to take on the challenge of creating a coordinated public and private sector plan to address Philadelphia's litter problem, part of an effort to set Philadelphia on a path to zero waste by 2035. Nick is also the co-manager of Emerald Street Community Farm in Kensington, where he lives with his wife and two sons. On behalf of the Office of Global Engagement and Education Abroad, we're so excited to have you here. Um, we have a screen cleaner to give to you as well. Um, so everyone, please join me in welcoming Nick. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Got my screen cleaner. Great. All right. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me, and special thanks um, to uh, the uh, Department of uh, Global Engagement and Education Abroad, especially Adam Zahn, um, for bringing me here, and also Hugh Johnson from Drexel for recommending me. That was very nice. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to be here today. Um, this topic, obviously, is near and dear to my heart. It's kind of what I uh, think about 24-7 in my job and also in uh, the world and in my life, just because the issue of waste is, I think, one of besides climate change, one of the biggest issues that we are facing on this planet right now. And uh, I'm gonna go through that and uh, talk about you know, the work that we're doing here in Philadelphia and why I hope that what I'm gonna say today really resonates to you all, um, both whatever you're gonna go into the world in, in business, policy making, any aspect of, uh, of, the, of your life, um, where this is gonna kind of tie in and, uh, and intersect. Um, but before I get into that, just real quick about me, because I always like doing this when I give especially talks at uh, or universities, is so my path here is a little strange if you look at kind of where my bio comes from. So I graduated college um, with a degree in English. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't really cue you up to be the zero waste and litter director of a city. Um, but what happened was after I graduated, a couple things that were really important. One was I did national service. And what that did was instilled in me a really, really deep rooted um, desire a deep-rooted understanding of the need to volunteer in your community to give back uh, and to be that kind of fill those needs um, so that really kind of put me on a path to public service no matter what I've been even when I've been in the private sector doing for-profit businesses that I've started um, I always kind of came at it from that mindset which you know lends itself to the triple bottom line as we uh, talk about then I ended up somehow, some way, getting into city government. Um, and before that, actually, uh, my kind of entree was in urban farming, and that's in my bio. And when people ask me like, what my zero waste cred is, I say that I'm a farmer, because farmers are the original zero wasters. If you run a farm right, there's no waste on a farm. You're saving seeds, you're creating compost. Farmers are some of the most creative people when you're doing it the right way of how you can reuse materials. So that cued me up to have a work uh, job with the city. And I was uh, working in the Parks and Recreation Department. And I was doing a lot of great things around land care, really excited about that. And this opportunity came up to start thinking more along the lines of how are we dealing with trash and waste in the city? And the managing director at the time wanted to put some thoughts together and he kind of looked at me as somebody who had a strange kind of expertise in all these different fields to kind of bring it together. So when we finally got the plan together, which I'm gonna talk about, just, you know, as it sometimes happens, we were in a meeting and he said, you should run this. And at first I actually turned it down because I loved working for Parks and Rec so much. I loved all the work that I was doing. But when I was actually sitting down with one of our grounds maintenance people and I, you know, became very good friends with a lot of our, uh, our staff on the ground and I was just explaining, you know, what I was going through, this opportunity that I had, kind of confiding in him, taking a little bit of a risk. And he turned to me and said, you know, I can understand why you're conflicted. I, I'm really excited too about all the things that we're learning here in these land care courses. They're great, but we can't do any of what you're talking about because all we do is pick up trash all day. That's what our job is. And that really resonated a lot with me because it made me think, yeah, that's really great that we can do all these things and we're talking about sustainable land care, but when we have this very, very solid, very real issue holding us back, how are we gonna move forward? So I went back to the managing director and said, yes, I will do this. And that led on to what I'm gonna talk about today. So again, really excited to be here and really hopefully you can get out of this talk is just how kind of the nuances and the kind of how you have to really look broadly to create really tangible change when it comes to policy and these initiatives. So I managed the zero waste and litter cabinet. As I said, it was created in 2016 through an executive order by Mayor Kenny. 
And where it came from was, and I think this is one of the most important things on policy, is when he was on the campaign trail and obviously being a councilman before that for many years, he knows about the trash problem here in Philadelphia. Show of hands, you probably lived there. Who's sick of seeing trash in Philadelphia, right? Every city deals with this. I'll get through why our city kind of deals with it a little bit more, but this is a global problem, but Philadelphia has a reputation for being pretty trashed. So there was a lot of talking of, you know, when it came to the policy of trying to pick up the litter in Philadelphia, a lot of what the mayor was being kind of guided into was that we couldn't keep going about it in the same way we had been going about it. And that was in a very siloed way. It was the streets department, they just dealt with what the streets looked like. And the parks and rec department dealt with parks. And the water department dealt with that. And there was collaboration, there was cross, there's not, this isn't a brand new concept to people, but a lot of it was relationship based. There wasn't a mandate coming down from above. So we kind of started thinking through, well, how are we going to make this policy? And we really started looking into this concept of, you know, giving people the resources, giving it from the ground up that they can kind of understand why they need to do what they need to do, how to latch onto these resources, how to utilize them, why they should be at the table, how's this in their best interest, but again, having that top-down mandate as well of saying, and the mayor said, we're going to do this, right? So how do we kind of create that feedback loop? Well, another big piece about this policy that we're trying to create is exactly that feedback loop because what we recognized and the managing director at the time um, who's actually over at Fells now, Mike DiBerardinus, you know, he recognized we can't just tell Philadelphians, you guys just keep wasting and littering at the same rate and we're going to clean up behind you. That is a terrible policy and it's unsustainable both from an economic and even a community and environmental standpoint. So we were looking through, well, okay, what are our options? What can we do? And we looked into the concept of zero waste. This was something that the Greenworks plan had been talking about for years. Um, so that was started under Mayor Nutter. It's our master sustainability plan for the city. And in a very smart and good thing, uh, exercise in policy, the Kenny administration just carried it over. He didn't try to, like, a lot of politicians like to kill the last thing the last person did, repackage it and call it their own, right? We just kept it going. But looking at other things, how can we really kind of ingrain some of the concepts of Greenworks into our city practices? So this concept of zero waste coming in to say, if we're going to make that initial goal of cleaning up litter, well, how are we going to sustain it? How are we going to actually look towards the future? And that's what gives us the future goal to 2035 to go to zero waste. And I'll get into that a little bit more of what we're trying to do. Another thing I'll say about my position that we were very cognizant of was that and I hate to say this because I don't want to discourage or talk against anything like we have an office of sustainability in the city and they play a very major part to kind of shift mindset, to shift resources, to make what priorities are. But if you don't operationalize the things that we're trying to do, they're never going to be successful. So even though I have a very deep connection with sustainability and we're in the same, they call them clusters in city government, where I kind of get directed a little bit more towards is the operational aspect. How is this actually going to work within city operations, with everyday life, with businesses, with commerce, with the environment? How are we going to bring it all together to make policy, and now this is the hardest thing of working in city government, that will outlast this administration, right? Because we do kind of live and die. I'm a political appointee. I'm working for this administration. Once it's over, what happens next? How much can I work to ingrain everything we're doing into just practice? And that's just how we're going to be doing things 20 years from now to get us to this 2035 goal. Another thing I want to point out on this slide, which I think is really important, is at the bottom there's five bullet points, and those are our five subcommittees. So there's waste uh, reduction and diversion, litter enforcement and cleaner public spaces, data, behavioral science, and communications and engagement. So the cabinet works by having big decision makers and commissioners and directors all get in a room every quarter and talk about the holistic work, ask you know, what the needs are, how we need to work together, what I need your department to do. It's almost a form of community organizing, which my background is in, but I'm doing it on a level with city government. But obviously when you get people like that in a room, not a lot's gonna get done, right? They're there to make decisions. Well, what are they making decisions about? So what we've asked them to do is every month they send their staff to these five subcommittee meetings. The great things about the subcommittees are two things. One, they all connect in some way, right? They're not these standalone silo committees. Data feeds into behavioral science, which feeds into our communications, which then affects our litter policy, right? So that's really important. The other thing I'd say, and when people ask me, what are you most proud of after the, you know, years that this thing's been around, is that the same people, if not more, are coming to these committee meetings. The same commissioners and directors, if not more, are engaged. This wasn't just some thing that everybody got real excited about. We did some press and then the report sat on the shelf and maybe we look at it when, you know, press gets bad and people are complaining about the dirty city. This is a living, breathing document. We're constantly adding to it. We're constantly updating it. And this initiative is still rolling along, which I'm really proud of. So again, I have a little bit of a leg up because as I said, 
this is a really, really important issue for our city. Not just how the streets look, that's just the end result, all the litter on the streets. Why zero waste? So first thing is just the hard and fact numbers. Philadelphia spends about $45 million a year disposing and recycling waste. To put that in perspective, the whole streets department budget, and that's for stoplights, highways, traffic, sanitation, other activities that they do, is $100 million. So almost half of the whole budget, that's not even counting trucks, uh, personnel, all that, is just paying fees to landfills and incinerators and recycling plants. That's crazy. That's a number that we need to decrease, and that's what we're working to do on the economics. But then how it coincides with the environmental side of things, another hard and fast thing when it comes to just how we're managing life on, in this region and on this planet, we're running out of landfill space in Philadelphia. So we've developed the five counties around Philadelphia and obviously Philadelphia to a point where it is really hard to build new landfills. The landfills that we do have, which is kind of ironic, you talk to waste management, they are very excited about the zero waste planning because it actually extends the life of their landfills beyond. Um, we don't want to build any more, we can't do it. We don't want to be trucking, There's, it's not cost effective to take waste and have to drive it up to Scranton where there are some landfills that are opening. Um, but on the environmental side, landfills account for about 7% of the methane gas that's getting into the atmosphere. That's a much more detrimental gas than even CO2 getting into the atmosphere for uh, climate change. And then landfills potentially contaminate groundwater, uh, they contaminate uh, the land into Superfund sites. Um, you know, again, I, when we talk about the hierarchy of using these uh, things, one is landfills are very archaic. The Romans used landfills, right? These are like 2,000 year old technology people are trying to use. Um, so that's, that's a big problem. Also, the future uh, actions are what's going to happen after they shut down. So right now, just the last year, the Kennedy administration got hit with like a $15 million bill for a cleanup we have to do for a landfill right outside of the city. Right? That was decisions being made probably even before the mayor was born, but now all of a sudden his administration is going to have to figure out how to clean it up. And that's very irresponsible that we're saddling future generations with these issues. So a way that we're immediately dealing with waste right now is incineration. Now, again, I feel like I would pick incineration over landfilling because it's an immediate uh, management of the waste, but there's still issues with that. What's coming out of this, even though it fits EPA regulations and we do, you know, all of the people we contract with play by the rules, there's still an issue of emitting uh, toxins into the air, of burning things to create electricity. Like we're trying to get away from that, right? That's not where the economy is going, so this can't be where our waste management goes. And I'm sure you might have read about this in the paper. There's a lot of advocacy around this, which I do agree with, is you know, in neighborhoods where there are incinerators, there are higher rates of asthma. It's, it's undeniable. The data is there, and it's something that we have to recognize, while also managing trash for 1.6 million people. It's a balance, right? It's looking for the long-term goals, trying to do the best thing you can do today while understanding the limitations and what you're working in today as well, which I think is a really important policy point. Another thing is that waste disposal um, historically has always been kind of put in, when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, about 3% of the greenhouse gas is escaping. But as we're starting to shift the mindset, right, and this is something that's going to be kind of prevalent throughout my talk, is that you can't just look at that end result because how is all that trash being created? It's being created by the goods, the materials, the things that we're making right now in society. It's crazy, a hundred years ago, the average person would own a couple hundred items, right? Like whatever's in their house, their clothes. They didn't have this disposable culture. But now if you take through even the forks we used at lunch, the plates, everything you're using on a daily basis that you're throwing away in the trash, the average person is gonna own millions of pieces of uh, trash every, in their lifetime. So it's crazy what we've done. Since the 1960s, we've been throwing away three times the amount of waste curbside. So all of that manufacturing, all that actually when you look at it, is about 70% of the greenhouse gases that we're creating, right? There's something inherently flawed about the way that we're making the goods that we need to live on this planet. And we have to rethink that because it is con contributing to the last bullet point on here, the undeniable crisis that we're facing as humans is the climate crisis. This is not made up. This is not a hoax. This is something that's actually happening right now, and we're seeing the results of it throughout our economy, both economically and then for, most importantly, people that are suffering through this. When I first started this work 15 years ago, you know, I was, I remember my family, they was, you know, you looked at it as like a tree hugger or just an environmentalist, and that's why you're doing this stuff. Oh, it's nice and good, but what about a real job? And, you know, 15 years later, I'm in Copenhagen with 
95 mayors that represent like a quarter of the world's population that are getting together to figure out how they're gonna deal with climate change, right? Things have changed a lot, times are different, and it's really amazing to see all you in this room because there's a great opportunity when you all go off into the world and the things you're gonna do to be a part of this and not just be put in this little box. This is gonna be how the society is gonna be driven forward if we wanna keep driving the society. So when we got together and we talked about how we're gonna do this, the first thing we really had to understand was what is our policy? What do we wanna do? Now you might hear zero waste and the, term, the number you're gonna, I actually took it out of this presentation is 90% diversion. So we recognize that with the way that we live in society, I was actually just at a health system yesterday Healthcare is a really good example. Like a modern medical system, there's gonna be waste that's gonna be created from it. It's unavoidable. You can't reuse catheters, right? That's disgusting and unsanitary and could lead to many big problems. Um, so you have to throw some things away, but you wanna get as close as you can to keeping things out of what we would call waste and putting back into productive use. So we do have those numbers and we have all those metrics, but the hard and fast thing is that by 2035, we basically wanna eliminate the use of landfills and incinerators by then. So we don't have to rely on that technology. We have new technology using the guidelines from the EPA. And where these guidelines talk about the first thing being prevention and source reduction. That is the most important thing you can do. How do we prevent the trash? The best waste management is the waste you don't create. If you can't do that, right, because you do need something to go, you need something that we have to, um, you know, some goods like that, reuse. So how can we reuse and kind of keep that culture going? Historically, reuse has been looked at as, you know, a little bit more of a kind of admitting poverty, right? Like you don't, you know, you reuse materials because you can't buy new ones. So how do we flip the script on that and change it? Especially in a time, you know, in a new paradigm that we're entering right now with this internet of things, right? Your toaster is gonna be hooked up to the internet in some point, right? It's gonna come with a user agreement that only that company can fix that toaster. How are you gonna be able to tinker with it? These are things that we need to think about and get ahead of on policy so people can do these things. Then you've got recycling and composting. Really important because, again, you're not going to be able to reduce everything. You're not even going to be able to reuse everything. But you are going to have to put, in a more industrial way, these materials back into productive use so we can grow food and make new products. And that's where that comes in. And then at the bottom is energy recovery and treatment and disposal. We try to, you know, although there will be energy recovery with some of the waste that we do have to create, um, there's much better technologies than incineration. We don't want to have to rely on that. We shouldn't rely on waste to create energy. It's, it's kind of a sick cycle that we want to kind of change that loop. So that's really what we're following right now when we look at all the policy that we're trying to do in this tiered way. And everything we look at is through that lens as we make decisions of how is this gonna affect the goals that were set out through this inverted pyramid. So when we sat down and actually looked at, okay, we have our goal, we have like the macro way to get there. Okay, what is actually gonna be the plan? So when we looked at other cities and what they were doing, and one thing that I hate to use the word critical, but I don't fully agree with this, some cities were getting really into, you know, by 2022, we're gonna do this thing and it's gonna take out 12% of the waste out of this waste stream and all these different things, um, all the like, numbers. I mean, again, I use data constantly. Data is, it drives what we do. It, it helps us be preventative. It helps us react in better ways. It helps us to evaluate ourselves. It's very important. But you cannot rely on it and just say what's happening today, the conditions, or what's gonna be happening into the future when you're kind of using data modeling, right? 10 years ago, who would have thought what Amazon was gonna to do to our traffic, to how we ship, to how we get things put to our house, right? You wouldn't have seen that coming, no, it happened. And we have to adapt as a city. How are we gonna manage congestion with all these deliveries? How are we gonna manage all the waste that comes with everyone being their own individual shipper rather than it coming to a single place where you went and bought it at a store? What happens to Main Street? That's the big political question when everyone's buying online. These are things that you kinda of have to understand how to plan for and be flexible. So it's great to have a plan, but the plan has to be flexible. So what we started with was more macro of how we're gonna get there, and a lot of it was what we were already doing. So the first thing that we did, actually before we even get there, some of the waste diversion highlights. Um, this is just to put into some numbers of what we're dealing with. I don't even have the numbers on here, but basically the city of Philadelphia produces about two million pounds of, or million tons of trash every year. Um, some of the ways that we've been diverting it, which we're really proud of, about 4,000 tons we've kept out, which is just yard waste and debris at our recycling center in Fairmount Park. Um, 4,700 pounds of donated food through food recovery in our parks and rec system. Uh, uh, the school district um, went from like 1,000 tons in 17 to 14,000 in uh, 18, which we're really proud of. Uh, 14,000 tons of solid waste material through SEPTA. Um, so you see those blue bins on the uh, platforms, they do work, we actually use them. And then this is kind of not the greatest number, but something that we do have to do, unfortunately, 8,000 tons of recyclable material that we skimmed from our waterways and then recycled. 
um, which again puts it more into perspective. They say by 2050, scientists, I say they, people who have studied this, um, by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight if we don't do something about this. Huge, huge problems. So where we were kind of seeing, where we always already had wins, where we can we already work through, was first our zero waste events. We're really, really proud of this, right? And we're actually we're a world leader um, out of all cities in the uh, world of doing zero waste events. It started in 2011 with our marathon, became a zero waste event. That's 50,000 people over two days, and basically we're diverting for every 100 pounds of trash, 90 are being kept out of the landfills and incinerators. So we kind of, you know, how we're proud of the marathon. We did that every year. We tried scaling it up to other events, didn't really work, didn't have a system for it. And then finally, when the cabinet was made, it allowed us to create this system, getting everyone working together. And just by better collaboration, better information sharing, and better systems, we went from three events in 2016 to, or, yeah, and to 25 events in 2017, which is a huge, huge increase. Last year, we had a little bit of a fall off because uh, we had a big ma a volunteer management platform that kind of we lost and we're now we're trying to rebuild. So we went down to about uh, nine events um, that we were able to do, but we're continuing to grow this program. Why are we growing it? It seems like, is that that big of a deal? A zero waste event, it's a one day thing. Well, we do think it's a big deal. One, because there's a lot of trash that comes out of these events that we have to manage. We've also learned is that the events that have better waste management are also events that have better, um, they're cleaner, they're better run, people really enjoy going to them. You see the people in the picture, they're what we call waste watchers, fill cyclers, zero waste, we have all different names for them because we keep changing our volunteer platform, but at the end of the day, we have the same people that keep coming out because they're passionate about keeping waste out of waste streams. I love the picture at the top, that's a whole family who came out to the marathon two years ago, it was like their family day out to go volunteer and do this. So we have people actually stand behind these three bin systems and tell people that's trash, that's recycling, and that's composting. When we do this at a uh, big public event, like something on the parkway, like the marathon, it's great because when people are coming here and they're traveling to the city, they see Philadelphia's commitment to zero waste and it resonates and it gets them talking and it's good for our image and our brand. But we do this also at a lot of community-based events and that's even more important because it helps us reiterate and reinforce what our waste management practices is to our residents. Again, this is, has to be understood on the ground and you have to find fun, cool ways to get people to do it. Another thing that we've done at these events, which have helped us really kind of figure out how to do this on the everyday scale, is food recovery. Food recovery is huge. I can't stress this enough when it comes to waste. In a country where we have, or a city like Philadelphia with a 24% poverty rate, the fact that nationally we waste about 40% of the food from when it's bought to when it could actually be consumed is insane. That doesn't make any sense in this society. It's a huge design flaw of our society. So we really try to get ahead of that and the lessons that we learned from doing it on single events is what we've been able to put into the school district or into Parks and Rec and hopefully into the school district one day to recover meals that aren't being eaten by students. No food should go in the trash. The next thing that we focused on was the data we're collecting. So, you know, we said to ourselves, if we're going to be telling businesses and, you know, the events, all these different people that they need to move towards zero waste, well, what are we doing about it? So another big thing that we tried to implement was a municipal building waste audit. So we identified uh, in 2017, 445 uh, buildings um, that are municipally staffed and municipally owned. In 2018, it jumped to 523 because we added our leased buildings. So parks and recreation especially will lease buildings to businesses. Uh, an example is like the Horticultural Center. We lease it to Star Catering and they do weddings there. So we added them because we want them to kind of work with us as well. And we do something as simple as asking every building manager, what do you produce and where does it go? That's all we asked. Now, if anybody's worked in city government or worked in operations, even that simple question was met with resistance. Because every time people hear stuff like this, they're like, oh my God, another form that we have to fill out. This is busy work, some dumb bureaucrat downtown. They're the one who's gonna look at this. I don't have time for this, blah, 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 blah. We faced all those uh, problems. But when we actually took the data and we were gonna take it into their challenges that they have, they started seeing some change, right? There was 10 police stations that just weren't getting recycling pickups. All we had to do was call the streets department and say, hey, can you do the pickups on these 10 things? Done. And we were told, police, they're never gonna buy into this. They're too busy, there's too much going on at these precincts, they're not gonna do it. We almost have 100% compliance from the police department because they're seeing the kind of the work that's coming from the work that they're doing. Uh, also really working on like recycling signage, um, more consistent pickups, education in communities. It really helps us know where it's not just the building manager that's not having a great 
diversion rate are having problems. It's the surrounding community. It's the users of the building. How can we work together to give them the best resources and education to make change? We've also done it just by the actual material. So when we know which materials people are having in their buildings, we can cross-check that with our contracts. Great example I always love to use is the fire department, another entity that they said, fire is not going to buy into this. They're too busy. It's, why do they care about waste? Well, it turns out they did care about waste because they actually cook a lot in their buildings. And when they cook, they would use a lot of uh, cooking grease, like you know, fat grease oil. So they were having problems because they had no way to get rid of it. They were putting it down drains. It was clogging drains. They didn't have, and they'd actually been asking for a contract for this. So here we came along, identified the need. They actually have a contract now where a company comes. It's a no cost contract, which is even better, um, and takes the uh, waste cooking grease off site and then they turn it into biodiesel. So it's a great way that we recycle it and we do these cool things. But they saw, again, that something would happen right after. I can't stress that enough. If you're going to make a policy, you have to have a plan for that immediate impact. It has to be somebody who says, this is working, I see it, even if it's not solving the entire issue right away. And then there's your true believers, the people that just are gonna champion your cause and you love them for it. And I can't think of a better example than this is at the, um, uh, the water laboratory on Hunting Park Avenue. So basically, um, all your water gets tested at this place. And there's some really cool people who work there. And they have a 75 person cafeteria and they had a garden outside and they said, we've got a lot of food waste, we have a garden, why don't we make our own compost? So they had their skilled trades people go out and build them a compost bin and they're composting on site in the 75 person cafeteria. These are stories that we love to champion, things that we're trying to do within city government that people can use their own creativity, their own initiative to make change and help us out. So we're making change, we're doing good things, we're uncovering all this data, we're bettering our practices. How's the commercial sector gonna do it? So we have a thing called the Commercial Waste Report. Every building in the city of Philadelphia is responsible for filling this out due to recycling laws. So it lets us know, are you recycling? How are you managing waste in your building? So we go through and again, compliance has been an issue. I'll be completely honest, first year, we had about a 10% compliance rate. That's out of 14,000 buildings. So at least 1,400 buildings actually wrote this back. But we understand we're gonna keep building this, which is another piece of advice I'd give anybody here who's gonna do policy. Policy's not always gonna work at first, right? If you can get that initial awe, that initial like, yeah, we had a win, and then you have to just keep being persistent with it. Too often people are just let it go when something doesn't work. We didn't get all this compliance that we wanted out. Just scrap it, don't do it. If you know it's worthwhile, you can show that it does work on this scale and that it can scale up, just keep moving with it. But you have to kind of have approach the policy from that aspect. So we're looking to get better compliance. And again, we're trying to do that through the data we have. So when we can tell a business that's a composting business that 5,000 buildings in Philadelphia want commercial composting, if I was a business owner and I was trying to break into the city, I'd do that, right? And that's 5,000 clients I can go after and there's not much competition in town, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is the kind of stuff that we're really trying to make change using the data. Then there's the incentives piece, right? So you can get the people that you can force them into something, you can force them into compliance, but you can't always work on disincentives. Like, you know, we can find people for not filling out their building or their commercial waste report, but how do we incentivize people to take the extra step? So we do that through the Zero Waste Partners Program. So I think this is another really interesting thing about understanding where the need is and how to fill it. So what happened was, um, and the strange thing about zero waste, is that even though many cities have made zero waste pledges, Dallas, uh, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, all these different cities, um, there's not a like equivalent to like the USDA organic label. There's not one, like the EPA doesn't have a certification for zero waste. So we had to take it upon ourselves as a city to be that kind of authoritative agency that could actually go and give people zero waste certifications and make it real in the city. So we created the Zero Waste Partners Program. Basically, we ask people to track their waste every month and they do it through these reporting forms. And then there's different actions. You can see in this pyramid, there's partner silver and gold. Um, so if you're diverting a certain amount of waste and you're um, doing a certain amount of the actions that would lead you to zero waste, that's how you get one of these really nifty little uh, badges that we put on buildings. So um, we have 50, actually this is amazing, um, city buildings. Uh, Municipal Services, City Hall, One Parkway, all our, the Criminal Justice Center downtown is all doing it, plus some police stations, um, some firehouses and some rec centers and libraries, and there are zero waste partners. So they're involved, they have a sticker in their window, they're tracking their waste every month and doing these actions. Then we have almost, uh, we have 17 uh, community partners. Now we're starting off slow, but we're trying to build this out, but we're really, really proud of this. Because when you're trying to incentivize people, one thing that they will qualify for is the sustainable business tax credit. That's real money on the table, which is good. 
But another thing is really the branding, because this is becoming, we've really got good about getting the conversation going around zero waste. So we have uh, a lot of people that are bragging about this, and they're putting it out so people can see, if I care about zero waste, I want to continue that in my life. Well, I'm going to go shop at a shop right that does zero waste, or I'm going to go get a six pack of PAPS at DNL Bar and Beer. That was amazing when that came in. That's like a little corner store in West Philly that got into the zero waste partnership. Like we want to see more of that as well as we want to see like two Logan Square, you know, a huge building downtown. We, and again, we made very proud of this because we made a prod or a um, program that can be used by a little corner store in uh, West Philly and also a huge skyscraper downtown. And they could use the same system and it's user friendly and they know how to do it. And the last thing that we had to really focus on was composting. So when I came into this work, again, listening to businesses, listening to industry, what are their needs, we found that composting was the biggest gap that we saw in the city. And the reason it was, was because there's no state permit for urban composting. So if you want to open a composting facility, they're going to cite you like a landfill. Well, that's, there's, like I said, there's a reason we're not building landfills anymore. There's no space. So how are you going to do that in a city if you're trying to open up a composting facility? So what we did was city government had to step in and support businesses, which, believe it or not, can happen. It's not just lobbyists going to businesses. We could actually be proactive and work with businesses um, to make a better landscape for everybody here in our city. So we identified a building in the Parks and Rec system. Um, this is a picture of what it looks like in our permit. So we did have to go through. There is a creek right near it, so we did have to follow the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, make sure that we're covering all of our environmental things. Um, but how can we get this cited? How can we get it up and running? And then how can we use this as the demonstration project for the first urban composting permit? And I'm proud to say after five years of doing this, uh, we finally released our RFP in December or in the fall, and we are this close to signing the contractor who's gonna run that facility. It's a private, a public-private partnership. This private company will operate it. They'll have their own clientele. And actually, I think this is really cool. I'm like so proud of this is I, we basically set up a barter contract, basically, in city government, which I think is so cool. They get free rent. They get free uh, use of the facilities. They can run their own business, but they have to pick up from the first year 30 rec centers, and then by the fifth year, all of the rec centers, 150, and they have to provide the finished compost a certain percentage to our farming programs in the city. So if they do that, they get the land for free, and we're creating this permit that is then going to benefit everyone in the state in urban areas. It's a crazy, you know, again, looking at it from how can we create the most amount of good in the best way possible, very utilitarian approach to policy making. Sticking with utilitarianism, um, also understanding the needs of a lot of our people now. Like I said, that's gonna take a little while to bear fruit. Well, what do people need now in the city of Philadelphia? Philadelphians hate keeping trash in their house over the whole week. We only have weekly collection. We live in very dense, small row houses. You know, we have more renters than homeowners for the first time in Philly's history. People don't want to do that. So what can we do to help support them? So we created this community composting network. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of good little gems in here about policy making. So we got money from Comcast and we just, uh, put out 12 different sites. They're on community gardens, school sites, neighborhood garden preserve sites, um, or they're like land trusts, and then private community gardens and parks. We're doing these three bin systems and we're teaching people how to run this in a community way. So it's run by community community buys into it, and then they can work to kind of keep the bins, you know, not getting smelly, uh, operating in the way that you're supposed to do that with composting. How we're doing that is we brought on through the grant money that we had a uh, contractor and a consultant that is basically making a compost manual that is then going to be used by these people on site. So not only these people, but this is going to be open source. Anyone can use it. So we're hopefully going to inspire many people throughout Philadelphia to keep building this network and keep giving people an option within their neighborhood. Big reason we're doing this is, I don't know if you guys have read the news but on this, but um, our recycling is in kind of shambles right now. Um, where most of our, so we had this great deal. We thought it was brilliant. China would put a bunch of plastic, you know, stuff that we buy in shipping containers, ship it over here. We take it all off. We load those shipping containers back up with a bunch of the plastic we use, ship it back to China, and they would make new products. Seems like a beautiful closed system. Well, it wasn't because about 9% of that plastic was actually being recycled. A lot of it was being burned. It wasn't being managed correctly, and the Chinese government's getting ahead of this. And they're like, we're not going to allow this anymore. We don't want the world's trash. We have enough of a market now here. We, can, we have our own plastic. You can keep your, pla keep your trash. So they kind of put the halt on that. And we were stuck because we kind of put all of our eggs in one basket of saying, okay, this is this great system. So when it fell apart, a lot of things fell apart. We're rebuilding that right now and trying to figure it out and we're trying to get it out to, so it's actually inspired us to do better. 
We're not trying to have the same problem with composting. It could stay local, it can stay right here in the city, it can spur as small businesses, and it could be a great industry, and that's what we're really trying to do. So those were the things that we had to kind of figure out on the upfront, right? We didn't have composting. It's, thir it's a third of our waste stream. We had to figure that out. Um, we didn't have, you know, ways that we we're managing and really understanding the data. We had to do that. So now what do we do? What's the next step? So the next step is we have to reinforce. We can't just walk away. We didn't, it's not done, right? We still have to manage it. So we have to take what we learned from our data to improve uh, recycling, donation, reuse, composting options in the city. And the next piece is, and this is why there's an exclamation point at the end of this, I try to use exclamation points sparingly, is reduce waste. That is the most important thing we can do. So how are we gonna do it? So one big thing that we're doing is this uh, initiative called Thriving Cities. So I mentioned I was in Copenhagen with a bunch of mayors from around the world. I was there as part of the C40 cities. So C40 started in 2005 as a initiative to get 40 cities who were gonna make drastic change on climate change. It's funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Soros Foundation, a bunch of different people around the world. 2015, the Paris Climate Accords come and go and a bunch of the countries, ours included, that made some very good commitments. And then speaking of administrations changing and what can happen, people pulling out of those commitments. Well, C40 is keeping everybody honest. They actually put us, it's about 96 cities, that's why there was that many mayors there, um, who are cities that have really signed on to these declarations to work together because they know we have to solve this and cities have to lead. Cities are gonna be the ones that are gonna change this. So as part of this network, we got into this incredible pilot program that they have called Thriving Cities. It's us, Portland and Amsterdam is the three pilot cities around the world that are trying to make change. And the change we're trying to make is ask the question, how can a city thrive? How can we build wealth? How can we take care of all of our residents? How can we just create a high quality of life without destroying the planet in the meantime? So we're following the kind of teachings of, it's our, our guru, um, Kate Rayworth. She's an economist. If anybody's interested in economics, even if you're not, she wrote a brilliant book called Donut Economics. And she did it because she believes that visualizing economies is really important. And the way she's visualizing it is through this idea of a donut. So in the middle of the donut is the shortfalls of society. That's gun violence, poverty, opioid addiction, all the things that we're dealing with, especially here in Philadelphia. But the outside of the donut is all of the things that we're overshooting, right? We're ocean acidification, uh, air pollution, climate crisis, all the things that we're trying to solve the, the middle of the, the social problems, but we're just destroying the planet in the meantime. The green part is the sweet spot. How can we solve those social issues while also being cognizant of not destroying our planet? So, you know, and again, where I give Philly a lot of credit, sometimes it's very frustrating living here. I'm a resident, I live in Kensington, I know what it's like. Um, but throwing money at problems and just growing the economy, right? That's not gonna solve things. We're really re, thinking what our relationship is to this growth, right? You might've heard Greta Thunberg at the uh, UN. Basically, it was beautiful watching this 16-year-old uh, person just go after these like big you know, bankers and all these really important people in the world of being like, your fairy tale of endless growth is crazy. It's not gonna work. We have to figure out other ways to run an economy. And that's what we're really trying to do with this initiative. So we've had a series of workshops and we're tackling it from the initiative of waste and consumption. Because really, we see that's at the heart of what's really driving a lot of climate change, this overconsumptive um, society, which is completely crazy, because then there's some people in our society who are under-consuming. They're not getting enough. How do we find that balance, and how do we do it? So what we looked at was some of the drivers of waste and consumption. So we sat in this room for the first workshop. We did all this workshopping. We did these like goofy drawings. Again, Kate loves visual representations all the words that came through and what came at the end of the day, these were the six uh, drivers of waste and consumption that people from city government, the business sector, community sector identified. And that's systemic inequality. Um, so again, I talked about that over consuming and under consuming. Value of time, right? Why does, why does to go convenience culture exist so bad, right? Because we're constantly made to feel like we always have to be on the go. We don't have time, you know? We have both parents working in the, uh, in the house. We don't have someone home cooking the meals and maybe reducing waste. Cultural values, so what are our cultural values in Philadelphia? Are there cultural values around waste and consumption? You know, the keeping up with the Joneses, right? Like everybody wants to get more and kind of keep up with whatever, it's kind of this race off the end of the cliff, right? How do we kind of like change those cultural values into things of not looking at things like reuse or, you know, reduction is admitting poverty, but it's a, it's a voluntary thing that you're doing, voluntary simplicity. Lack of education, and that's across the board and that's across socioeconomic uh, classes as well. That's from the youth to older adults. 
how much you're making a lot of money, you're not making any money, right? There's something across the board of how people are being educated and what they're being educated for. Distrust in institutions, which is something I deal with every day as a, as a government employee. And if anybody wants to go into government, there's a lot of beautiful things about it, but there's a lot of challenging things. Like whenever you go out to a community meeting, get yelled at for an hour because people just think, you know, Ronald Reagan, he set the tone when he said that, you know, uh, the worst thing you can hear is somebody say, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? It's been years and years of making kind of defaming city government and making us look like we're, you know, not inept, you know, crazy people who can't help anything um, just to build up the, uh, the private sector. Well, we have to kind of build those institutions and now it's kind of leaking into the private sector too. And then short-term profit, speaking of the private sector, this idea that just like whatever's good for making money right now, that's what we're going to do. That's what has to happen. And again, it's completely antithetical to the um, triple bottom line and really looking at not just your profit, but how are you treating people? How are you treating the planet? So those are the drivers. We're going to be meeting again in March to look through what are the global initiatives and what are the Philly initiatives that we're doing right now that actually address these drivers. And we're hopefully going to come up with a roadmap to address waste and consumption. So we're super excited about this program because you're looking at it in this holistic way of how you're going to solve that reduction problem that I talked about in the beginning. And the crazy thing about my job was when I first took it, you think, oh, we're going to do recycling and composting. And I didn't think I'd be, you know, working with like economists from London about, you know, value of time and the short-term profit. And that, but that does come into this work and that's the intersectionality that you have to look at. Don't let your scope of your mission get out of control until you don't even know what it is anymore, but have to look outside to really figure out what you're doing inside. And the last thing I'll leave you guys with, and this is from the uh, World Trade Organization. And again, this is amazing that they're putting something like this out, is the future circular. So have anybody show of hands, people have heard of the circular economy? Okay, good. There's familiarity in this room. And the circular economy is this idea of disrupting the make-take trash model. That's the linear model of what we do now. We extract from the earth, we make a product, we give it to somebody, they use it for maybe 30 seconds, and then they throw it in the trash. That is insane. And as population increases to 10 billion by the end of the century, we're not going to be able to do, do that anymore. So we have to get into circular economies. And I kind of put a little subtext in here, circular, but with many circles, right? It's not going to be this perfect circle where everything's just going back in, right? There's going to be many different systems that have to kind of exist concentrically on the same plane at the same time. And what I love about this one, and I really kind of, again, it's all about mindset change. This idea of between biological materials and technical materials, between consuming and using. I don't consume this cell phone. I use this cell phone, right? I don't consume this microphone or computer. The lunch we had, we did consume, right? It's organic materials that you're putting in your body and there's a system for that that can break down and be put back in. So there are certain materials that we do in a way consume. But what we need to get away from is like that glass bottle that you're using, the electronics, your clothes, right? You're just using that for the time being. And there was a time when those corporations wanted that back. If you looked at a bottle, a beer bottle, a Coke bottle from beginning of the 20th century, it said like a property of Coca-Cola on it. They wanted those bottles back. Now things got really cheap in the 20th century Oil went, it got really cheap um, because of exploration. Um, glass was easy to make. Well, that's not happening anymore. We're not going to be in a fossil fuel economy in a couple years or a couple decades probably. Um, we're actually running out of sand, which is crazy to think. Like sand that you can use to actually manufacture glass. There are shortages of it. So we're going to start getting forced into this, but let's get ahead of it before. So how do we, we can do that with circular economy? We can work through to think back, how can we, everything that we're using, understand how those products are going to make it back into the manufacturing stream and keep those circles flowing. Understanding what your material is actually made of and how it's going to get back into productive use. Again, year, even five years ago, this work, that's why it was always about zero waste. It was put on you guys. You needed to do zero waste. You need to recycle more. You need to compost. You need to bring your you know, water bottle everywhere you go or put a straw in your pocket. I mean, I do these things and I believe in it, but the systems have to change because that's not getting us far enough, right? The manufacturers have to understand if they want to stay in business and they want to keep us thriving, not growing, this is what they're going to have to do. So this is really what we're starting to push to kind of meet people halfway. People have to understand the systems, they have to be involved, they have to care about it, but the systems actually have to adapt to what the needs are for how we're going to live on this planet, how we're going to thrive and how we are going to make it forward. So I'm glad that there's so many people in this room listening to this message and hopefully our allies in that. And I thank you very much for your time and open up for questions. I think so just call on people. So um, I think that was the first thing I saw back there.
Sure, so that's a great question. So first I'd like to address, because you brought up about the burning. So this was, again, uh, I, I love the media and fight with them at the same time. Again, this was one of the other sides of it, of um, they didn't cover it very well, because it was a very sexy story, right? City burning, us recycling. And what happened was we were in the midst of a contract change. The contract lapse, we were in what they call a spot market at the worst time you could be in a spot market, because that's when the whole China thing came down. And we found it really hard to find a recycler that was going to be able to take all of the city's recycling at that time, because every the whole industry was on its head, and this was their little doorway to not have to take all of it. So it was something we were forced into, but we got a new contract. We were able to negotiate it. And since last May, um, we have been sending all material to the facility. Now, that doesn't mean it's all getting processed. About 25% of that material is being trashed and probably incinerated because it's contaminated. It's not meant for a recycling stream. So to your question about what to put in, we're, again, messaging is really challenging, especially when you're doing it for 1.6 plus million people, right? So what we're saying is getting back to the basics, right? And the basics of recycling were like glass, plastics ones and twos. So that's when you look on a little piece like, and you see the recycling symbol, a one and a two are the best ones to do. Um, aluminum cans, aluminum's always had a good market. Uh, metal's not really down right now. Metal's always staying pretty steady. Um, it's just about how they're getting the metal and, um, and uh, how it's being processed. But that's still a pretty good winner for us. Cardboard, um, in, in the industry we call it the Amazon effect. Cardboard is through the roof right now, both needing it and then how we're getting it in our waste stream. Um, and then, like I said, mixed paper. And we're actually trying to figure out what to do with mixed paper because it's not really a great material. Um, and the Chinese are doing this crazy thing. They're like planting a amazing amount of trees because they're looking to really corner the paper market right now So and not doing it to that. So those are the materials that you should really um, kind of focus on. Uh, other things that we're going to hopefully open up in the city and make it more accessible is electronics. There's already drop-offs that you can do, but we're going to hopefully make that more accessible through some partnerships. Uh, textiles, um, but again, those don't go in your blue bin. I would really say in your blue bin for curbside recycling, it's just plastics ones and twos, paper, tin, um, and glass. And the problem is that, and this is where we call it wish cycling in the industry, they put these, so one through seven is the um, different types of plastics. Seven just means anything. It could be anything. It could be any, and three is PVC, right? So it's like, people see the recycling symbol and they're like, oh, this is, no, throw it in the blue bin, they'll take care of it. And for a while we encouraged it because we just wanted to capture material. We can't do that anymore. So we really are getting back to that education. Um, so again, those are, that's what you should really be recycling. So no three through seven? No three through seven. Wow. Yeah. Um, that, right there and then over there. Yeah, so, we're going to be publishing that on our website. We're building the bins right now and getting them out. So we'll be putting that on cleanphl.org, which is our main site. We'll have a nice map and you'll be able to see. And I can't off the top of my head even remember all of them, but I want to wait until it gets published. Um, I don't want to leave anyone out, but it's very dispersed throughout the city, which we were, and that just happened organically, which we're really proud of for an equity standpoint. But, you know, the money that we spent to build the bins, I mean, that bin that you saw, that three bin system, it only costs like, I mean, it might, this might be a lot for certain communities, but we'll try to work with them on fundraising between three and $500 to make. It's really about having that manual on how to set it up, how to like run the community aspect of it. So we'll have that and we're looking to do training. So if you wanted to bring it to your community and you had a little bit of fundraising to build, we'll help you set one up and pull you into the network, put your site on the uh, internet and hopefully uh, more people can take care of heart. And probably in April when we're done building the bins. Compost, yeah. Yep. So yeah, so again, when we say how we made Philly's plan was we had to make it for Philadelphia and what the conditions that we're, um, we're facing uh, in the city. So 
One thing, I, and I'll admit this, I mean, again, I came in after it, so I wasn't responsible for this, of, but the single, and this wasn't just Philadelphia, everybody went to single stream because it was sold to all these cities as a much better way to do it. And in a sense, it was. I mean, when we were doing source separating, Philly actually had one of the first recycling curbside recycling programs in the country happened in Philadelphia. It was for paper back in like 1981. We actually had an organics pickup from 1930 until 1990. Trucks used to go, you talk to any old timer in the city, they remember the green bin. They'd fill their green bin up, a truck would come by and take it to pig farmers in Jersey. So we did these things. But what happened was, it was we were probably at about 6% recycling rate when we were doing source separated. We moved to single stream, it kicks up to about a 23% recycling rate. So even with the contamination, it was a lot lower contamination when it was source separated, we're still getting more material and more. So every neighborhood in Philadelphia is reporting recycling. It wasn't like that when we did separation, but it was a shortcut. You know, it was great. There was an equity thing there. It, it opened it up to a lot more people, but what if we invested a little bit more in trying to keep source separation? What if we tried to figure out, again, collections is tough. Which gets to my other point when you talked about somewhere like Italy, they have the community trash cans, they have these pieces, things like that. I was just in Milan on a study tour around waste. So they have the same population Philadelphia does, maybe give or take a million people. They have 55,000 front doors, they call it. So 55,000 locations they need to pick up from. And a lot of that's because people live in high rises. Philadelphia, where we predominantly live in single family homes, and now those single family homes are being converted into three apartments, is 585,000 households that we pick up from. So it's really hard for us to make that change when everybody's been just so used to the culture of my own single family row home, get my pickup, and that's just how it is to be like, oh no, no, now you're gonna have these community trash stores. Some neighborhoods we have the vacant lots for it, some we don't. So we've looked into it. It's something I really wanna move to. It's just those barriers are something we really have to try to figure out. But yes, yeah, source separation and uh, taking down how many pickups we need to do would be amazing for the city. And it's something that strategically we're gonna have to do in the next couple of years in the streets department. Right there. So, We've been hesitant to mandate composting because we don't have the infrastructure here in the city to do composting. So once we figure out the landscape, that's when we can make more of those dead things of saying like you have to compost. And I don't know, that's yet to be said if that needs to be a state level or that needs to be a city um, mandate. So we're looking into doing that. We do work a lot with institutions. A lot of our systems are set up. Drexel should be doing waste, um, the commercial waste report because they are technically commercial buildings. Um, so we, w I mean, we've worked with Penn on this, we work with Temple on this, so it is something. Um, we actually had universities in the room when we built that program to kind of inform us. And it's not just universities, there's like health campuses, um, larger campuses with many buildings, but it's one hauler, so we have been talking about that, and something that's on our radar. Um, fellow right there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for doing that and having people come and do it. Um, we, uh, now, so right now, again, we did take a bit of a hit with what happened with the recycling markets and the same grant money that was there is not there as much in the state, so we were kind of re-looking at what to do, but we are looking to relaunch a volunteer management platform, how to reward people. That is something that's on the radar of the city. Um, there's a lot, again, I have, Recycle Bank's changed a lot as well. They've, they've gone through a whole merger and change, and they're, they're looking at a different way. I mean, a lot of what they were, the behavioral science they were operating with when they started 15 years ago has changed a lot, like what incentivizes people to do this. And especially now it used to be, we're making all this money off of recycling. Now we're not making money off of recycling. So what does that look like? So now everyone's trying to change together. So it was a really good time to go through the transition. We're still going through it. I think there was a hand over here. Sure, that's a great question. I mean, so I would say, you know, still utilizing the bins, right? I mean, it is getting to a center and it is being sorted. I mean, for all the things that are troubling about the recycling industry, if you go to, we call them MRFs, material recovery facilities, they are 
pretty brilliant how they're set up. I mean, it's all geometry and physics that get thing. You, it does happen. I mean, there's a big bale of aluminum. There's a big bale of cardboard. It does get put on the international market. But what we're actually going to be launching soon is a uh, recycling donation finder on our website. So you could put any material in there because a lot of what you're putting in your bin might not be stuff that we actually want to take. So like I said, we're only taking those limited things, but now we're going to give another tool that says, oh, batteries, um, light bulbs, uh, other like harder to recycle materials, here's where you can take it. And there are, and there's, the market's opening up dramatically right now for people that are more specific materials that they can take out of the waste stream and getting better systems for doing that. So that is coming. So I would say keep using your blue bin when that, keep an eye out for the uh, recycling donation finder. It'll be a nice, really easy to use. Um, it's not an app, but it's just all you get very easy to use website. You'll be able to put any material in and figure out where it goes. Um, I'm right there. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And again, I think that's where like cities need to lead, right? We need to bring this technology here, how to do it here, but then it needs to get out to the rural counties. We're very fortunate in Philadelphia. We have a lot of processing power, whereas in the middle of the country, they don't, they don't have places to take, you know, electronics and metal and things like that. So um, I think uh, one thing that I'm involved in, um, I don't know if people know this name, but uh, Judy Wicks, she's kind of a, a local legend here in Philadelphia, started the White Dog Cafe, um, all these really cool things. And she's just started a new initiative called uh, All Together Now PA. And she's trying to, on many different levels, but one is zero waste, trying to connect the rural with the city to kind of share best practices on how we can work together. So that is something that people are looking at. And you know, as a, as a Philadelphian, and even especially as a city worker, I mean, it is, it's a tough relationship. The, you know, when you hear from Harrisburg how they feel about Philadelphia, it's not the greatest, um, they don't have the greatest outlook on this city. And a lot of it, I think, is extremely unfair. And just, I don't want to get too far into why I think these things happen, but you can read into it of why. Um, but we have to start looking at, you know, have some pride in Philadelphia, um, that it's a, our major city. It is the driver of the economy of Pennsylvania. And um, how can we work together to, you know, Bit better these systems and they can have a lot of this homegrown in Philly and then get it out to the rest of the state. Um, question there? So, um, Maybe this was purposely, maybe not. Like, so I, I, didn't, I didn't look to see if Drexel's filled out a uh, commercial waste report before I came. It's another trick of city government. We call it plausible deniability. So I don't know. I don't know if you guys have done it. Um, so, uh, but it is something to be able to look up. And again, it's something that we don't do the waste report to shame people or go after people. We do it to be like, hey, this is going to benefit you. So if I did look back, I'd love to get in touch with people here and talk with my colleagues tax here to be like, hey, you guys should be doing this and we can work better. Well, again, I think that's a longer conversation between the universities, but I will say I, the reason that I came here today was because I actually sat down and met with the sustainability team. People were involved in this. There's like, I forget exactly what it's called, but there is initiatives here at Drexel from staff and faculty um, to address these issues. So it's really great that that is happening. Um, and uh, again, there's, I think, lessons to be learned from Temple and Penn. I'm sure Penn and Temple can learn things than you guys are doing. But what we're trying to do is really just connect everybody. So um, that's more conversations that I'll hopefully have with the folks here at Drexel and that you should have too. I mean, advocating from within is important as well. So is that time? That is time. So I can answer any questions I'll be starting, but thank you guys. So we'll have about 15 minutes to break. Um, in this room, there will be a panel starting at 2.45, um, and there will also be a panel in room A. If you're more interested in global business and economic development, that panel will be starting in this room again in 15 minutes. And in room A, a panel about global, local, community solutions and innovations will be happening.
And this session is about uh, global economics and business. So the format, what we'll have is um, we have four teams of speakers. So each speaker will come up and speak for about seven or eight minutes. And at that time, some speakers have team members who would like to join them. Uh, when your speaker comes up, if you want to join them, you can just walk right on up and stand here with them. If you're shy and you want to stay in the audience, that's OK, too. Uh, and then after each speaker has cycled uh, through and we've heard all four presentations, then the speakers will um, be, uh, return to their seats here and we'll have a general Q&A where you'll be free to ask questions of any of the speakers. So that's the format. And so without um, further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Christina Salyuk, and she's here to talk to you about sustainable solutions to food packaging waste. Thank you. Hi everyone. Oh, oh, hello. Sorry. There we go. I just want it to be higher. There we go. Hi everyone. I'm Christina, and I will be presenting about sustainable solutions to food packaging waste. Um, so, the first thing that I want to talk about is the demand for food for food packaging. Of course, it is definitely a need in our society to have food packaging. It protects our food, um, it helps us to transport it, it provides us with information about the nutritional values as well as branding. Um, so these are really important aspects to, aspects to consider when thinking about food packaging to make sure that we can, as we create new solutions and new ideas, we still keep these needs in mind. Um, however, there's also a large amount of effect that food packaging causes in our society. Plastic is relatively new, but it's already created a lot of issues. Um, the U.S. is the largest food packaging waste producer in the world, and specifically, food makes up about 45% of all of the waste that, land, that ends up in landfills. So if you do a waste audit on yourself and you open up your trash can, I'm sure that, like me, most of you will find that a lot of that what, what we see in our trash cans is food packaging waste. So there's a few things to think about when we're talking about waste. The first thing is our waste behaviors, um, the way that we on a daily basis consume products and how nowadays we're living in a single-use culture. Um, along with this, there's a, lot of th there's a lot that has to do with waste behaviors about how we recycle, the effects of single-stream recycling and people's trust and confidence in the recycling systems and how that affects our waste as well. Um, so some of the challenges of waste, as I mentioned previously, is the health determinants on both our planet and ourselves. Uh, microplastics end up in the oceans and break down and not only in the oceans but we can also find it within our own bodies. We consume about 50,000 uh, particles of microplastics per year on average. So that's a really alarming number and we don't really know what that means yet in terms of health effects. That's something that we'll probably start to see studies coming out that might signify what that means for us. But as of now, it's just something to put out there <laughs> that we're consuming that much plastic. So another challenge is that it's expensive to recycle. As we've heard, um, about half of Philadelphia's recycling goes straight waste to energy, so it's not really being reused, it's more so being burnt to produce energy. And then again, about 15 to 20% of all recyclables are contaminated, meaning that food or spillage, meaning that it's not actually being recycled. And then 32% of all plastics end up within our ecosystems or on land or in water. So I'm going to go over a few really brief systematic solutions to our food packaging waste, um, talking about ways that our systems can change. And then I'm going to go through the, a few different technologies that are being implemented that would allow us to have our quick living pace while still um, creating materials that are more composable, compostable. So bulk buying is an idea that's becoming pretty relevant nowadays. A lot of supermarkets are taking this, this, market, uh, this, this market and implementing it in their grocery stores. So bulk buying requires a lot of previous planning. It requires for some people to carry funnels to put materials in through large bins and containers, as well as having glass jars or other reusable totes and bags to store the materials within. 
Um, it can create the problem of branding because the branding is not as obvious. You don't take it home with you, but it, it can still be branded by putting the names of the companies on the larger bins where we get our food products from. So this could be an alternative to traditional grocery stores, but again, this requires a lot of planning as well. So another system that has existed in the past, my mom would always talk about how environmentally friendly the Soviet Union was um, because they would get a lot of their products delivered in containers that, they would, that would then be collected and refilled and then brought back to them, or they would go to a central point to uh, bring the packaging to and, for, to and for to get those products refilled. So although this is a system that has existed for a while, it's now starting to be implemented by online services. There's one called Loop, which does just this. You order things online, um, it's delivered to you, and then you bring, the consumer uses the product, and then the packaging is collected again and refilled. And this, can, this exists in a number of modes and through subscription-based services. So another thing to think about. So what is it actually that makes packaging sustainable? It's important to think about which materials are being used. Um, recycled content, that's a pretty good signifier if packaging is made from recycled materials. It's also important to think about avoiding the use of mixed materials because the more mixed a material is, like you know, having 20% plastic, 20% hemp, whatever, the more difficult it becomes to actually recycle that material because it becomes difficult to separate that. Um, minimalism is important. A lot of times we see overpackaging, an extreme amount of packaging, and secondary packaging within our packaging. I'm sure you guys have opened up a box where then you open up another box on the inside and then another box to finally get to your product. So being aware of that and the functions of that. Um, efficiency, how long will the packaging last? We don't, there's, there's reasons to have single use packaging that has a very short lifespan, but is there ways that we can extend the lifespan of our packaging, as well as innovation and experimenting, experimenting with new materials, and as well as looking to the past for better solutions, such as natural materials, which were used for most of our civilization. So this is a quote that I found by a design studio, a research studio called Matter, and they said that by harnessing the unexplored potential of materials, we can implement social, economical, and political change. So this is one of the things that they've created. It's, they call it smart materials. It's made out of flax. And you can see basically the whole process of the lifeline of how this packaging material was created. It's using flax to basically create strands and then that strand can be worked into like a fabric. And then at the end you get a end product that's a chair. And all of this is 100% recyclable and reusable and also decomposable and not leaving so much of a trace on the planet. So alternative plastics is another idea that's being thrown around right now. Um, there's two different types, the two main forms. One of them is PLA, which is made from sugars and cornstarch. So as you can see on the, in the picture, that's kind of how that process works, as well as cassava and sugarcane. And the second one is uh, PHA, which is a plastic that is made from microorganisms that basically consume organic material to produce plastic. So although these ideas seem good, um, they actually have some cons in that you actually need a lot of land and there seems to be more pollution that's being produced from making these materials through pesticides and fertilizers and the whole agricultural process. So a few companies have thought about this and thought, that, and thought of ways to solve that. So one of these is full cycle, which replaces traditional um, take, make, dispose consumption cycles with a circular economies, and basically they use agricultural waste and byproducts uh, from organic materials to basically do the same thing, but instead of taking new agricultural products, they're using what would already be thrown out. Mushroom packaging is another idea that's been around for about a decade. It just hasn't been uh, in the mainstream of packaging, but it's a pretty innovative solution as well that, whose main ingredients are hemp, flour, and mycelium, which is a, it's the vegetative root structure of mushrooms. As you can see here, it takes agricultural waste and then uses the mycelium as a type of glue to basically make a product that can be molded. It's almost like styrofoam, except that it's not nearly as hazardous for the environment as styrofoam. 
And this way, any shape can be created in order to create packaging solutions. So I wanted to end this by talking about um, there's kind of two different sides of this. There's the side of where we can make individual changes in our life to produce less waste. And then there's looking to the market and demanding as consumers from uh, the stores that we buy our food from to make changes in the way that they sell their products, as well as the brands that create those products. But for now, <laughs> what we can do is showing support to companies and local organizations that kind of are aware of, the, of these ideologies and supporting them. And so I want to put some local initiatives, which are pretty close by to us, so that people can start thinking about the way that in their daily lives, uh, the actions that they take when buying their food. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so I think I actually forgot to introduce myself. I'm Mark Stair. I'm in the Department of Economics. So that's, that's all you need to hear from me. Um, our next speaker um, is uh, Lindsay Debo. And she's going to talk to us about, um, her topic is how can companies decrease food waste due to confusion about food product dating. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Harish Rubindran and I'm presenting with Lindsay Debo today. Uh, so in our team, we also had Kavina Patel and Neil Patel. And the topic we'll be discussing today is food waste, and more specifically, the misconceptions behind food waste. Uh, so show of hands, how many of you throw out your food if it's expired or is approaching expiration date? Well, uh, did you know that the misconceptions behind food product dating is one of the biggest reasons why uh, food waste is one of the biggest problems we have today? So looking at the food waste statistics, about 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted each year around the world. And in the US specifically, 30 to 40% of food waste is due to uh, consumer waste and supermarkets. And 90% of Americans waste their food due to uh, the misconceptions of food product dating. Um, com food companies use three different labels to put dates on their products. They use sell by dates, best if used by or before dates, and then use by dates. The sell by dates indicate to the grocery stores and supermarkets how long they should leave the product on the shelf for. It's mainly used for inventory management purposes so it doesn't have a lot to do with the consumer. The best if used by or before dates indicate the time period when the food is at its peak quality. And then the use by date indicates the last date that is recommended for consumption before it starts to decrease in quality. However, none of these dates are safety labels, so it's still safe, completely safe to consume food past any of these dates. So Lindsay and I decided to send out a survey. Um, we got about 70 responses. And we asked three simple questions. Um, if survey takers knew what the sell by date meant, best if used by slash before date, and the use by date. So the blue sections on each of these pie charts show the correct answer for each of these uh, questions. And you can see that 83.1% of our survey takers said that uh, they knew what the sell by dates meant. Um, this, however, is rather irrelevant because, uh, like Lindsay said, the sell by dates used for suppliers, and uh, it's more of an inventory management purpose. It doesn't really serve any need for the consumer. Uh, looking at the best if used by slash before date and the used by date, this is where it gets a little more uh, scary because uh, less than 50% of survey takers knew what either of these, date, either of these dates meant. Um, this is a lot more alarming because these dates relate directly to the consumer and uh, because they don't really know what these dates mean, it shows that uh, the food waste is a big problem and more specifically the misconceptions of food waste. So the last question we asked in our survey was if consumers look at uh, the expiration dates of a product to determine if they should buy the product or not. Um, and looking at the survey, 79% of people said, uh, yes, uh, expiration dates do matter when they want to buy a product. And this shows that consumers have like this perceived notion that food that is approaching its expiration date or has already passed is viewed as unsafe or suboptimal. Um, generally, you would want to buy a product that is expiring in two weeks rather than uh, expiring the next day. And uh, because of this, supermarkets are forced to throw out these unpurchased products because they would just remain on the shelves for an extended period of time. And uh, to prove this, a sample study was conducted 
basically 30 people were given two samples of yogurt. One uh, sample was expiring in a day, and one sample of yogurt was expiring in two weeks. And 100% of uh, the people that took this uh, sample study said that both samples taste the exact same. Uh, so this shows that expiration dates don't really matter too much. Um, more so, it, they, because they taste the same, it shows that uh, expiration dates are just are like a warning label. Um, and more so, you should throw out food when there's signs of spoilage. And signs of spoilage include uh, changes in odor and changes in color. Um, we researched a couple of solutions for both individuals and businesses for this problem. One of the biggest individual solutions that we came up with is just general increased awareness about food product dating. It's really important to make sure you know when your food is actually still safe to eat so you're not throwing it out prematurely and making sure you're looking at the signs of spoilage. And then once you're absolutely sure that you can no longer consume it at, like with the signs of spoilage, it's important to compost your food if you can just so it's being repurposed and not being directly thrown out. One of the biggest solutions we have for businesses is uniform dates, and by that we mean just a clear and consistent dating method across all food products. Um, this can be done by having just one type of date, and this could be federally regulated if necessary, but businesses could also just implement this themselves. There have also been some countries in Europe that have um, attempted to start doing this. They have um, no longer been printing the best if used by or before dates, just to decrease customer confusion. And then this has shown a significant decrease in the amount of food waste, specifically in the Netherlands. Um, another solution that businesses have is to register their companies with certain apps that alert users of discounted food that is approaching its expiration date. So then those consumers and users of the apps can go get the food before it's expired and then the stores or restaurants are no longer forced to throw them out. Um, the last thing that businesses could do is give a brief explanation of the dates if they don't choose to have a clear and consistent way of doing it. Um, this can be done directly on the food products or in the like food sections of the grocery stores. So we've already established that food waste is a big global issue, and with that comes a big global economic impact. So local restaurants and grocery stores would save about $145 billion per year if they did not throw out their produce that is expiring or has already expired recently. And also using clear and consistent labels in households would save about $6 per kilogram uh, per day. So this is a big uh, uh, number in the long run and it shows that uh, there's a big economic strain. So to conclude, as Lindsay and I were saying, um, using a lot of solutions like concise uh, labels, uh, also registering uh, your restaurants to apps, uh, composting, and just overall increased consumer awareness can lessen the economic strains that are faced by households and businesses. Uh, thank you for your time. So I have to confess that there were two yogurts in the refrigerator yesterday, <laughs> and one was dated February 26th, and the other was dated March 27th, and I decided that I'd better eat the February one immediately because it was expiring. <laughs> so. <laughs> But having said that, um, I just ate it because it was older. Um, if I find stuff, if I find yogurt in the refrigerator that's a month old, I will do what they recommend. I don't believe it goes bad. I open it and I look at it, and if it seems fine, I just eat it, and I'm still here. So I think we should do what they say. Um, I'm living proof. All right, so our next, our next speaker is uh, Lev Boonin. And Lev is here to talk his topic. His topic title is Waste Not rot not, and a sneak preview, it has to do with food trucks around Drexel. Afternoon, everyone. So, if you go out to the quad around 2 p.m. every day, you'll see a pretty familiar sight. Food truck food is, after all, a staple of students' diets here, and we eat a lot of it. In fact, styrofoam takeout containers are used a lot in the United States, so much that we use about 1,400 tons of the stuff every day. And each one of these takes about 500 years to decompose. So the question is, how do we maintain the convenience and the efficiency of these takeout containers 
while negating the externalities that their life cycle creates. Well, my proposal is for us to shift to compostable containers and for our universities and other institutions like it to institute a rot can system. Now before I dig too deep into this, I just want to explain something very important. There is a difference between something being biodegradable and something being compostable. If we are being technical, literally everything is biodegradable given enough time, whether it be that 500 years it takes for the styrofoam to decompose or the several thousand years it's going to take for the plastic in your cell phone to decompose. Everything eventually is biodegradable. By contrast, compostable usually means a shorter amount of time, but it has to have either an industrial scale facility or digester or there or some other kind of artificial aid. So when a company markets its product as being compostable, that doesn't mean you can just drop it on the ground like an apple core. This means that it needs to be put into a specialized system or process to break it down into the fertilizer or, or soil that the company intended it to. Now with that in mind, here's my plan. Drexel will buy a large bulk order of compostable containers to create a container bank. Now these then will be resold to the vendors at cost. Now the reason it's done this way rather than the individual vendors buying them, them directly is that because Drexel can buy so many at once, they can take advantage of economy of scale. Now this means that it, when you order enough of something, the individual unit price goes down. And the result of that is that Drexel can make it that a compostable container could be economically equivalent or less expensive than a styrofoam container for these vendors who already are counting in their pennies. However, as I said earlier, you can't just toss one of these things on a heap and expect it to turn to, turn to dirt. Or dirt. <clears throat> That's why we need the rock cans. A rock can is basically a compost recycling bin. Now, this would have to be paired with an education campaign. As our earlier speakers have discussed, there is such a thing as aspirational recycling. People will toss things into a recycling bin because they think it either is recyclable or they think it should be recyclable. However, often what we think is, isn't. And the result of that is that it will contaminate the stream and possibly make it that the entire bin can't be recycled. The same goes for composting. Now there are a lot of different ways to do this education. It could be done through classes, pamphlets. Personally, one I like is something that they did at the University of Washington where they set up screens above the trash cans, one for the trash can, one for the recycling can, one for the rock can, and it would show pictures of what goes in each can, help give visual aids, and when you tossed the right item into the right can, it would use weight sensors and other pieces of technology to give you an estimation of the impact on you and your environment that properly disposing of your waste has had. Now finally, Drexel will need to set up a contract or create their own composting facility to make sure that this rot process works. Now, the city of Philadelphia has recently begun a community center-based composting plan in order to make our city these food waste reduce. Now, Drexel could either help create a community center composting facility of which they will be the primary user or they the mm, I'm sorry or they themselves will could set up up a facility which members of the community could be welcome to use making them a good citizen of our city and in reducing our food waste and the benefits of this plan are numerous studies have shown that by handling food waste through composting rather than the traditional waste apparatuses it can reduce the handling costs by up to 62 percent per ton in addition the rot process creates fertilizers, which can either be given away to local community gardens, resold, which can and subsidize, break even, or even make a profit off of this, or just as to as create a new source of fertilizer that Drexel could use themselves to reduce their costs in our, our garden or our lawns. But most importantly, it just reduces styrofoam usage, which, as I said earlier, 
is desirable. Now, of course, of course, there are some obstacles to this. As I've already said, the education component cannot be overlooked. If we do not educate people right, we might just be creating a new can that people will throw whatever they think is supposed to go in there. But that is overcomable. We are, after all, an institution of learning. The setting up of this program will require further research. Coordinating a manufacturer who can produce at the scale and the price that we need. Making sure that there is individual vendor buy-in for this program. Um, putting the rock cans and the, the uh, composting facility in place. All of these, though, are something we can overcome. And of course, there's resistance to something new. Some people, well, according to some studies, have actually resisted using these containers and other compostable products because they think it will affect the taste or the quality of the food. However, given time, these concerns were allayed and people just started using them. My point is, is that let's not waste this opportunity, let's rot it. I've already submitted this plan into Drexel's sustainability office. The ball's in their court now. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I have another personal anecdote. Um, so I noticed also, so when I you know, have plastic at home, I'm always, why, why are the numbers so small? I, I, I feel like, that, why, would it cost that much more money to make them bigger because I'm squinting? I feel like sometimes I've had to take my phone out and take a picture of it to blow it up so I can see if, it's, if, it's, if it's the number is one of the ones I can recycle. But anyway, I've seen people, I'm here like <laughs> sorting through stuff and people have just gone up and just thrown some plastic into the recycling bin and I was like, I don't, I don't think that one's recyclable. And the answer is exactly what you said. They said, yeah, but it, it should be. And if enough people put stuff that's not recyclable into the recycling bin, then they'll start recycling it. And I'm not sure it works that way. That's like saying if um, you, I take a hamburger and throw it in the, wave it through the produce section at Whole Foods, it'll be vegetarian. I don't <laughs> think that's how it works. Um, so anyway, um, I, I definitely have noticed exactly um, what you said. I think it's a great idea, so I, I hope Drexel moves in that um, direction. I also have styrofoam guilt. Every time I go to the trucks, I, you know, and there's that styrofoam. And a lot of the styrofoam is not, I don't think, recyclable. You have to take it to a special place. So uh, styrofoam is theoretically recyclable. However, due to the nature of styrofoam to basically absorb anything that's put in it, the grease or the, uh, just the residue from the food will make it that you can't recycle it, even if you take it to a specialized facility. The same thing is true for pizza boxes. We think they're recyclable. But when all that, but other than maybe the lid of the pizza box, the base where all that grease is, you can't recycle that. Well, you'll be happy to know when I ordered a, one of those delicious pizzas from the pizza truck in front of the library, I tore my box in half and I put the greasy half in the trash and the other half in the recycling bin. So, pat myself on the back. <laughs> oh, you guys, stop it. All right, so um, our last speakers are uh, Brandon Yan and Luca White Matthews. And their topic is how job, retaining, job retraining programs can help minimize workforce waste in the automotive industry. I'm Brandon Yan, that's Luca White Matthews. Uh, our other group members are Kate Sansom and Satchel Manchester. And uh, our presentation was how job retraining programs can help minimize workforce waste in the automotive industry. All right, so presenting the problem. Uh, the automotive industry, after constant uh, rise and expansion after the Great Recession, has actually really slowed down in the past couple years. And this is due to a number of different factors, uh, one of them being the introduction of technology. And this is both on the product end with the shift towards electric vehicles, as well as the manufacturing end with the shift towards automation and technology and robots replacing human labor. Now, because of this general slowdown in the industry, uh, many major car companies have started to reduce uh, or labor, they just cut and labor out. 
And so our question is, what happens to that labor? Like, who are these people and how can, because these are actual people with real families and real jobs that they need to support. And now they, have, they no longer have jobs. How can we support them and retrain them to, to learn transferable skills to be able to be reutilized and reintegrated back into the workforce? So for a little bit of historical context on the United States automotive industry, uh, right now, uh, sales have been slowing for the past couple of years, and there's two primary factors for this. The first being the shift towards electric vehicles. Now, as all these companies are chasing to be the, like, the top electric vehicle, they're uh, cutting costs with uh, labor, and they're reinvesting that into R&D and shifting their manufacturing processes to be able to support the shift towards electric vehicles. Now, uh, the social factors included in this is the fact that Gen Z and millennials simply aren't buying cars at the same rate that previous generations have been. Now, this is important because sales, as, as sales go down, that leads to companies making cuts. So General Motors cut 14,000 jobs last year, and it's looking to be more and more uh, in this upcoming decade. Ford cut 7,000 in there in an attempt to cut $25 billion of operating costs, and Nissan's entire like, US branch or sector is essentially dissolving because of lack of performance. Now the third kind of factor going into uh, the US automotive industry right now is the political climate. Now the point is no one really knows what's going to happen. With the trade wars going on, the upcoming election, there's a lot of different things in the air and the industry hasn't reacted well to it. So then thirdly I'm gonna talk about the kind of demographic of employees that are being displaced. So they're primarily white middle-aged male workers. Now this is important because of geographically where they are placed. It's, it's a very stereotypical and standard story of like, you have a Ford plant in Ohio and they employ half the town. Now when that uh, production factory becomes obsolete and when it's no longer used, half that town is no longer able to support their families. And if they were to work in the same sector without any new transferable skills, they'd have to move, pack up and move their family across the country to other factories to be able to work. And that's just simply not feasible. The other major market that automation uh, is starting to affect and that the automotive industry is starting to be impacted by is China. Right now, China is the largest automotive maker globally. Basically from the 1990s up until 2018, China uh, and their automotive industry have gone through an economic boom. They've seen growth rates of 10 to 12, even up to 16% year over year. It's been incredible, wealth has risen massively. But for the past three years, that automotive industry has started to shrink. Uh, starting in 2018, we saw a 3% decline. In 2019, an 8% decline. And now it's predicted to be uh, conservatively a 9% decline this year. It's key to remember that this is one of the first times ever that the Chinese automotive industry has actually declined. Uh, and we'll get into why that's relevant in a little bit. But on top of kind of those broader issues that Brandon talked about that are also starting to impact the Chinese automotive industry, there are three main current events that are also impacting China. First off, they highly subsidized their electric vehicle manufacturing process because they wanted to remain competitive with China. As soon as those subsidies were removed on the consumer side, sales plummeted, and now all these factories that had reworked their entire assembly line were left without a consumer base to buy their product. Furthermore, coronavirus that was located in Wuhan and now expanded, Wuhan's actually known as the motor city of China. Almost every car manufacturer globally has a factory in Wuhan. Because of the shutdown of all those factories, it's estimated that up to today, 1.7 million cars worth of production have been lost. And just in February, China's seen a 92% decline in car sales, which is insane. If they sold 100 cars last month, they've sold eight this month. Furthermore, the US-China trade war, as Brandon talked about, is limited growth to about 6%, which sounds high compared to America's normal growth rate of 2.3, 2.4. But when China's used to returns of 10% or 12%, six is a very massive difference. Now, the Chinese Communist Party has historically tried to limit unemployment as much as humanly possible because when workers are employed, making money, and are generally happy with their conditions, they tend to be more amicable towards the, the CCP's control over the country. What they've noticed is when unemployment goes up, individuals become more likely uh, to create social unrest or to protest the government. So they're left with a very hard decision of whether to continue subsidizing these companies even though they normally would fail, or whether for one of the first times in their history they're going to start letting massive parts of the industry fail. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the current issues with uh, our retraining programs here in America today. So first off, everything comes down to funding, and we just simply haven't poured enough funding into their, our retraining programs for them to be able to be successful. 
Uh, as you see, 63%, we're down 63% since 1993, and it currently doesn't seem like it's going to be anywhere uh, to be improving. The secondly, also has to deal with funding, is the allocation of these resources. Now, because our economy changes so rapidly and so drastically so quickly, the, the amount of skills, or the types of skills that are necessary to perform well in this economy are changing rapidly as well. And so, uh, whoever's providing the funding, they don't know where to put that funding. I'm just gonna give an example. Say we invest $20 million into coding and for, to retrain people with coding. Say five years down the road, our economy's changed so drastically that coding's no longer a skill that we actually have to teach. So then that $20 million is just wasted. And so that constant shift of economy is making it really difficult to allocate specific resources. And then the third way, uh, the third reason that uh, current retraining's really become difficult is integration with, tech, with traditional education. So uh, currently, retraining is its own separate entity, which makes it very difficult to, for, other, for unemployed workers to actually attain and uh, be able to learn those new skills. If we were able to integrate that with traditional forms of education, like community colleges or trade schools, it'd be a lot easier and a lot more effective. Um, while all of this may sound bleak, obviously the industry is starting to slow down and it seems like it's going to be slowing down permanently, retraining programs have a bunch of issues. There's actually one country that's doing incredibly well with retraining programs and that's Sweden. It's quite possible for America and other countries that are starting to face these unemployment issues to model that. Essentially Sweden, uh, their government and their unions have a symbiotic relationship to deal with unemployment. The unions have become pseudo responsible for retraining initiatives themselves and running them and operating them and the government is become responsible for workforce research, which tells those unions where to uh, distribute the resources and, and how to go about training. Sweden is one of the only countries to increase public and private workforce retraining funding, and they've also had incredibly high success rates. Some of the unions have reported as high as 90% success rates with their retraining program. It's also key to keep in mind that this doesn't come with an increase in taxes or some other form. Uh, all it was was an increase in union wages by 0.3%, which is pretty minimal when you consider how much uh, most individuals are already contributing to unions there. There are certain issues, though, that could make this a harder system to translate to America and China. Firstly, in the U.S., there's lower union membership than in Sweden. Uh, within the automotive industry itself, only about 7% of workers are unionized, compared to about 67% in Sweden, which is a massive difference in terms of the amount of money that they're able to bring in. Similarly, in China, there's only really one major union, and it's managed by the Chinese government. But to put it in context, 303 million individuals are a part of it, which has doubled the entire workforce of America. So they're able to pull in a lot of money, their issues are more on the social side than the funding side. Conclusions. Um, implementing the Swedish system is incredibly important and it's incredibly important to start doing it now. The automotive industries in the US and China, if you'll bear with me, are basically patient zero in this larger epidemic of unemployment that's going to be coming down the line in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, three main factors that are contributing to this, deindustrialization, slowing consumerism and automation, those are things to save for an entirely another discussion. But the net net of it is that 800 million workers are expected to be displaced by 2030. That's only 10 years down the road from now. Economies, governments and societies need to start adapting now in order to be prepared for the future or we're going to have an absolute mess of unemployment on our hands that the government is going to be ill-equipped to deal with, doesn't have the funds to deal with and overall we're going to fail millions and millions of people. Thank you guys so much. If you have any more questions, we do have a poster over there, so feel free to come and talk to us. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. Yeah, so as an economist, uh, you know, obviously a large part of what I do is study the economy, and this is what you see. When new technologies or new problems emerge, there's always different types of workers that are needed. And so retraining is a tough one there because oftentimes the new industries don't employ the same workers as the ones who are laid off from the old industry. So it creates a lot of uh, tension. Um, but sort of building on the China theme, I think the Chinese character, if I remember right, for crisis contains within it the character for opportunity. So if we're facing an environmental crisis, it's also um, a business opportunity because it's creating all, types of, all different types of new jobs. So as students, the answer for you is to make sure that whatever type of education or degree you get, you're able to adapt to new circumstances because whatever you graduate and do, odds are you won't be doing the same thing in five years and your ability to adapt to the new situation is gonna depend on the skills you develop as an undergrad. 
So learning you know, a specific computer program is great as long as that's what people keep using. But as we know, people aren't really using BASIC anymore. <laughs> right? That was the 80s. Now they're using Python, and in 10 years they'll be using something else. I already have a program on my computer called Anaconda, which just you know, tells you things are just going to keep changing. So I should stop talking, though. Um, and what we can do now is take questions from the audience for our um, panelists. So any topic or any panelist, feel free to ask away. <laughs> So my question is, uh, our population is uh, divided according to the age groups, like baby boomers, millennials, uh, Generation X. So how do you expect the new technology if they're trying to adapt and reskill their employees? Do you, don't you think there will be a lot of resistance according to this age bar? Because the more you get older, like you were saying, like Python, these are not the things people, is, people are going to use. And I, I think, I mean, what do you think, which population is going to adapt to reskill the employees? Well, that's not coming out. Um, yeah, it's a very complicated issue, for sure. Obviously, as we were talking about the, the age demographic that a lot of these workers are in is kind of that 40-year-old category, which means to get a little bit stereotypical or broad or generalized about that audience, they're not necessarily the most tech literate. Um, most of them didn't grow up with computers. In fact, all of them did not grow up with computers, nor did they grow up coding or having computer education. So it definitely makes it a bit harder. Um, the reality of the situation, though, is it's something that needs to happen. So obviously computer science is one way that we can retrain people, but other retraining programs are focusing on moving from blue collar to blue collar, um, just into different industries. So if we're in the automotive industry, teaching people new skills that will help them move to the steel industry. Um, whether that's a sustainable long-term solution is another question. But yeah, it's something that's still being worked on. It's incredibly hard. Um, but yet again, it's something that has to be done eventually. Um, how would you think Andrew Yang's uh, universal payment program would fit in? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's definitely a, a valuable thing. Um, I think it obviously depends on how the UBI system is structured. There's a lot of research that goes into it and a lot of different people that have tried to set out different values, right? So that's the first question. Is it a UBI that literally has you meet the poverty line or is it a UBI that puts you above the poverty line and gives you the flexibility with what you do? Regardless, I think it serves as a buffer for individuals that become unemployed. I think it's unrealistic to think of a UBI as something that's gonna end employment as a whole, um, especially within the next 10 years, which is the big question. Um, when we have 800 million people that are likely to be displaced within the next 10 years, that's not at the same time frame that automation is gonna completely erase the job market from the world. So it's a good step. It definitely provides families with a lot of the support that they need. There are also bigger kind of macro questions around how do we fund it, how do we set it up in the first place. Um, but yeah, it, it is a good buffer for families that are left behind. Sorry, I forget what your name is, but that you in the middle who talked about um, rot. Sorry, not you, that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you? How would you think uh, introducing these like compostable um, packaging in like urban and uh, that other cafeteria here? Do you think that would be uh, an easier sell to introduce this technology at Drexel? <clears throat> Well, uh, actually, um, Hans actually already has something like this. Uh, the Han when I was doing my research, uh, I spoke to some of the people at Hans, and they said they already have a uh, biodigester, and uh, all the food that we scrape off our plates supposedly goes into this thing, which is then composted. So there is uh, some technology for this already. Uh, obviously, at facilities like Hans, it's a lot easier because you don't have to account for 
uh, compostable plates or forks. It's just, you know, all food waste. Everything else is just reusable dishware, or at least it was when I was a freshman. <laughs> um, so, my, uh, but my um, focus was trying to make it that the food trucks could transition, largely because, at least from my personal experience, food trucks are a major staple of our diets, especially after freshman year when we all run from the Hans as fast as we can, or we did when I was a freshman anyway. Showing my age here. Um, but uh, also, if the uh, university can make this work, then other economic corridors in the city that have a lot of food trucks drawn to them, such as Center City, University of Pennsylvania, Temple, can also try to make something like this work. And that can then be spread uh, further. Uh, did I answer your question? I'd like to commend you, Lev, for what the work you're doing in the compostable containers um, and to let you know that pretty soon it's going to be the law in Philadelphia in a couple years. The Clean Air Council is currently working with our city council now that we've outlawed plastic bags to work on the styrofoam containers. So you're really ahead of the curve on this. I had a question for Christina and Lindsay and Harish. Um, in your research and maybe just your ideas, what do you think of the trade-off between packaging and the dating system? Because there may be some instances where having a container or a package that sustains the life of the food is also more detrimental from a climate or environmental standpoint. So if we want to waste less food and work on the dating, we have to have a different container. In a container that may be better, the food may not be. So I'm just wondering what your ideas are or if you read anything about that, because there was definitely a correlation between your, your work that you did. Um, so I think that there is kind of a trade-off that comes both with what is inside of the food in terms of like using preservatives and the packaging. I think for me the biggest answer to all of these questions is to not have our food be coming from so far away from us, to have food be more localized and that way it doesn't need to last, it can be more perishable and that way it doesn't need more uh, extreme packaging or preservative scenarios to keep it fresh. But I think that that's something that will take a really long time to start thinking about integrative food systems in our, and how that can become more supportive of populations on a local scale. Um, I didn't do a lot of like research on this, but I know like if we were to move towards more environmentally friendly packaging, like having the more clear and consistent dates would like definitely decrease the food waste then because like food might not last as long, but then consumers would be more aware of, of how long it would last and then they wouldn't be like throwing it out early, so. Uh, my question, I guess, to the three of you is to do with the dating. Did any of you do any research as far as using the food that might have been dated and like Trader Joe's throws it out like three days before to be able to provide it for um, homeless shelters or to give food to people who are needy because there are people that will go through the trash bins and they will take the food out of there. Now I know that there's legal issues but there's got to be, I don't know if you did any research to see if there's any way that it could feed people that need it and it's still viable food. Um, I didn't do a ton of research, but like at the beginning of the project, I saw a little bit about this, and I know there are some organizations that do take the food that like stores are about to throw out and like donate them. And I also did a little bit of research on uh, restaurants that do take that food, and then they like cook them for their uh, people that come to the restaurant. So that's like another way that the food can be used. So. But how does that get out to the public so that they know where to go? Look, I'm in the food business. And anything that's been on a buffet, 
cannot be given to a shelter. It can only be the food that's in the back of the house. So the food's still good in the front of the house, but legally you're not, you used to be able to do it, but you cannot do that now. I don't know, I haven't done a ton of research on that, but. Um, um, well, I know there's definitely like an ethical problem uh, of like not being able to feed homeless people, if, especially if like the food's going to waste. Um, but yeah, like Lindsay and I really haven't done a ton of research on like how we could get that across. I know this has nothing to do with the research we presented, but uh, I actually work for a nonprofit called Sharing Excess, um, and they do that. They're the, the middleman agency. When it comes to getting food distributed from people that provide it, um, the buffet thing is something that governments so far seem pretty unwilling to budge on, which makes sense. But for example, uh, in the Drexel community, Saxby's, Wawa, Giant, Heirloom, um, Landmark, and then all of our, our dining halls are actually part of a network. Um, where students pick up the food and then bring it to homeless shelters or other food banks around campus. The reason we're legally allowed to do that is Good Samaritan laws, um, specifically around this, which kind of protect us. So even in the off chance that we do bring some sort of food that you know was contaminated or wasn't healthy, um, because we're doing it under a nonprofit banner, we can't be held legally liable for it. Um, so it, it is happening, it's growing very rapidly, um, especially in, in college communities where it's a big focus. So in addendum to what you're saying, yeah. what about for students who cannot afford to feed themselves? Yeah, we actually also um, manage that on campus with Sharing Excess. Um, we have a program called the Food Scholarship that's run in collaboration with a company called Misfits. Misfits essentially takes uh, food that doesn't look good but is great. Um, and sells it at a discount price. Right now, I think we have 15 kids on campus on the food scholarship program. Um, essentially, every month they get a big box of produce and other goods that they're able to use. We also run a meal swipe donation program, which took us forever to negotiate with Airmark because they don't want to give up any of their profit margin. But essentially, any freshman or any student with a dining plan now is able to donate one of their guest meal swipes towards an anonymous uh, swipe bank and any student that qualifies for that based off of financial need and so on uh, is able to get those anonymously distributed to their account. I have a question for you three. So I uh, previously worked in a cafeteria uh, when I was a grad student and I found that there's a lot of food waste for the undergraduate dorm uh, when you serve them dinner and food. And uh, even that date was like, they said that this date is, you should be throwing, but they were literally in good high quality food. So have you seen any example where a large university is collaborating with some uh, organization, nonprofit, where they are distributing this food for a little low socioeconomic people? Like, because I saw that picture where you are literally throwing high quality food when somebody could have benefited. For example, another example I see when you go to the grocery store, you see there's a tab called manager special food. And I have consumed that manager special like multiple times in Walmart or something like ShopRite. They were never bad. I never had any uh, issues with any health. But have you seen any collaborations where these dates are so misleading and you just throw them to trash, but there's so many people who don't get food? Um, so one of the things that Lindsay and I were talking about in our presentation was uh, how a lot of uh, restaurants use have these apps where they can like notify people if the food is gonna uh, expire soon and it, it goes for a discounted price. So um, I guess to address that question, um, these apps would I guess help people with lower like in a lower income class like try to get that food that they wouldn't be able to at the higher price, um, and especially because the food wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily go bad. It, because like Lindsay and I were talking in our presentation, um, uh, expiration dates don't really matter too much unless it's like there's signs of spoilage on that food. I, I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of waste in the undergraduate, undergraduate uh, program because people are super sensitive about these dates and they confuse them and I think the whole university has a policy that they have to throw but they could have been used somewhere else, yeah. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question. We might be running into negative time, but one more question, if anyone. Do you have one? Do I have one? 
do you have one? <laughs> um, um, what would my question be? Um, yeah, um, yeah, so given with a lot of these initiatives, for example, recycling, a lot of times the cost to me is pretty high, but the benefit to me is actually not that high. The benefit is to the 8 billion people, or the, co uh, the benefits go to the 8 billion people on this planet. So, but the benefits do exceed the cost, so from a social perspective, I should recycle, I should do these things, but from my own personal cost-benefit analysis, it doesn't make sense because the benefit is not big enough. I bear the whole cost and only a small part of the benefit. So what's the best way to incentivize people to do these things that are in the social good but not their individual interest? This is a classic economist question. What do you expect? <laughs> well, um, that's actually, uh, you know, as you said, it's a, very, it's a basic economist and policy question. Uh, I'd say that there's three main ways to do it. One is to give people a profit incentive. For example, some states uh, have recycling uh, refunds. You know, you bring in a certain number of bottles, you get, you know, a certain number of cents per bottle. That does, that has been found to incentivize, you know, proper sorting a little better in states and counties that use it. I'm from Michigan, 10 cents a bottle. Exactly, you know, oh, 10 cents a bottle. So, you know, people are incentivized to do that. Uh, the second way is to make it just seamless. So part of the way uh, I was approaching my policy was just to make it, okay, if it, you know, you put the food into the food can, it's just, you don't have to think about it too much, it hasn't incurred any extra cost to you, people will do, will take the path of least resistance. And the third way, guilt trip them. Like, uh, it, this, that it's, I, I know it sounds kind of corny, but, there's a reason that nowadays we have a whole greenwashing epidemic with products. People want to think that they are you know, environmentally friendly because we have successfully made large segments of the population so aware of their impact that they will pay through the nose to make it that uh, they think that they're not having that impact anymore. So if we can make that a little more honest, a lot less expensive through subsidies and uh, regulation. You know, we have already put enough collective guilt into our culture that I think we are moving in the right direction on that. That's interesting. I, th I read a paper where they said the, the, um, the guilt or the status signaling from a Prius is about $600 a car. So that's real money. I mean, the other thing I would add to that is a lot of times it's a, it's a cost to you, but it's a benefit to everyone else. To the extent people care, about the benefits other people get. One way you can show that is when you do it, when you do something like that and other people see you doing it, mm -hmm. you're telling them that you value this. And so if they care at all about other people, that raises the benefits in their mind. So you're sort of signaling the social benefit through the act of recycling or the act of doing all these things. And if someone's totally selfish, that won't work. But if they have any recognition of what the people around them value, then that increases the value in their mind of doing the act. So it's sort of, it's a little bit like the guilt you were saying, but it's sort of a social contagion. I mean, it's also because they're selfish, they want validation and they want to feel a sense of, oh, I'm doing my bit at RU. So, you know, oh, everyone saw me taking out this big, full can of recycling. I'm doing my bit. Yeah, spill it so everybody notices and then mm -hmm. pick it all up, right? All right, well, we've gone into negative time, so I'd like to thank all of our um, panelists and the audience for your great questions. Thank you.